very good morning every one of you i'm sort of sandilya i'm full time uh, my voice is audible yes sir yeah thank you so much um i'm sort of sandilya i am in charge of academics as less communication at my rehab academy today i am the i am the instructor who will be taking about cardiopulmonary physical physical therapy conditions what are the techniques we use normally my rehab academy is a platform as you know that connects the fresh graduates students aspiring uh, professionals as well as the working professional with the best of instructors across the globe we have been conducting our lot of physical uh, conferences as well as seminar as well as the workshop everywhere in the country but uh, dur during ongoing uh, pa uh, corona pandemic lockdown we have gone right from physical to digital so uh, for being digital uh, conferences as well as the workshop we are one of the best brand that have been acknowledged by one of the india business award academy also and uh, now uh, in this series this is the uh, i don't exactly remember what is the number but we have given more than 500 hours of teaching on the digital platform till now in the lockdown so we haven't stopped our work we haven't stopped uh, the learning part of the human life so as a physio <clears throat> it's always uh, good to learn and update yourself so this is how we are going to do today and we are going to learn a lot of new concepts so our academy has certain rule but i would like to let you know that uh, minimum 65% of the time you are supposed to be on the video for better interaction then only the certificate part uh, they'll be making it ready because they have calculation for each and every second and they'll be calculating whoever has more than 65% attendance on video and more than 90% attendance on audio they will only be eligible for getting certificate so i would request you that you come on the uh, video as much as you stay on the video in between our internet connection might get disturbed due to the weather condition due to the local issues or whatever but uh, we will be trying to reconnect but i ensure you that my voice as well as the picture will be totally clear and this is not all i'm not going to do only the theory part theory part will be hardly 10 or 15 percent or maximum 20 percent it will be totally practical oriented part so be connected on the video ask me the question wherever i ask you whether it's clear or not and uh, i guess uh, in your platform there are two or three will be uh, connected still and other platforms people are joining so come on the video and introduce yourself and level i have to give you the teaching are you a student or come on the video another two minutes time and please introduce yourself Yes, Sanjunivas. Yes, Najir Alauddin. Yes, yeah. please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning to all. So, I am a college respiratory therapist working in Qatar. Very good. And good presently, I am the team leader of a COVID-19 team in our country. Wonderful. In Klein Hospital. Wonderful to know about your profile and uh, I hope that uh, being the corona warrior you, your work will be totally acknowledged even be at uh, our academy acknowledge your work thank you so much Najib, for joining uh, definitely we'll be talking about uh, covid in between uh, i'm not expert at covid of course but uh, i'll be uh, trying to give you certain inputs what i have observed during uh, my uh, experience that uh, kindly have a better interaction and let me know if i'm uh, anywhere i'm going away from the evidence or something but i'll be giving all the evidence based input Thank you so much, Najeer. Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, Dr. Ravi. 
yes uh, good morning i am um, sedu nivas ravi i am st- uh, pg student in cardio studying in chennai um, sri ramachandra college yes sir very nice profile uh, i hope that you have better time ravi and then try yes, to thank you, connect sir. as much as possible yeah. and uh, we'll have a long interaction of course today uh in spite of some three hours it might get extended up to five to six hours so be patient and in between you can go for your breakfast we'll be having a break in between no issues and uh, other participants should be wait or should be start slowly our theory part let me say because the uh, other participants i don't see i mean bhastriti tamanna deepmoni sahiram yeah tamanna yeah Yes, Tamana. Your voice is not clear. Be a little louder. Your voice is not clear. Be a little louder. Okay, no worries. You can switch off your uh, video and then you can speak. I think there is a connection problem from your side. Yeah, please tell. okay i guess uh, there is a internet connection problem from tamanna side i hope that my voice is totally clear to every one of you and uh, let's let us start i'll be sharing my screen in a second now so today's workshop is about the physical therapy condition a physical therapy in cardiopulmonary condition i introduced myself So major topics to be covered today: subfunctional so anatomy of CBS, PT assessment and goals in cardiopulmonary disorders, mechanics and methodics behind every goal, manual techniques with demonstration. Of course, I'll do after one hour. We'll start it. Selection of techniques with exception and exercise prescription. We will definitely see some manual therapy part. and electrotherapy part in cardiopulmonary disorder and then of course patient education and nutritional nutritional part in cardiopulmonary disorder if even with the time scarcity i am not able to cover this nutrition part please remind me i would like to talk very important in relation to covid as plus well for normal uh, cardio respiratory patient what we can do for their better nutrition so that your physical therapy works very very well with that so <clears throat> so here are you able to see my screen yeah okay is there any problem in seeing the screen please let me know and uh, i have arranged the board also we will be uh, talking and discussing something over the board also 
So, functional anatomy, when I talk about the CVS, you people are well aware about it because, right, since the first year of our physical therapy and medical science, we study about the anatomy and physiology. So, today, when it comes to the uh, cardiorespiratory condition, I would be discussing only and only advanced part of the functional anatomy, which is actually workable for you. Look, I have taken various, many a number of times, workshop and conferences over the cardiopulmonary disorder. The major problem what I understood from the people, they say that, sir, we feel problem only at one place that the doctors, they don't think in us in certain level. They feel that our work is quite limited, right? Is that happened? You have felt it? So that is the one issue. <clears throat> Another issue, they feel that, I mean, they don't understand what is their frame of working. You got my point? Frame of working. So these are all the kind of issues they feel when it is a, uh, like when they go to the hospital or in their OPT when they deal with the cardiopulmonary cases. Okay, fine. Maybe at end today, you will be more uh, with knowledge as well as with more expertise that you can actually work on this. I will try to uh, give you the manual also that will be reaching by academy to you manual as well as certificate on or before 28th of the means on or before next Sunday to you. Anyway, introduction and the goals in general, cardio respiratory physiotherapy techniques can be applied to the treatment of wide range of patients with acute lung disease, chronic lung disease, advanced neuromuscular diseases, major surgeries like cardiothoracic, abdominal, etc. Sorry. Uh, you can mute yourself and then uh, speak. Patients in ICU, as well as the difficulty in increasing breathing. So these are the normal conditions what we feel that we need cardiopulmonary physiotherapy techniques to apply. So what are the, our major aim of the PT techniques? Look, whatever your PT techniques are there, you have just four M's, basic four M's. First M is to manage the breathlessness symptom control. Then do you do what? Airway clearance method. I mean, airway clearance comes the second M. Third M is mobility improvement or maintenance, right? And then at last, of course, you are able to make the patient adjust with the family, social, as well as the work life. What we say the ADL improvement, through ADL improvement, you do all those things. Then goals based on your problem list, what are the goals? Reduced lung expansion, impaired airway clearance, increased work of breathing, impaired exercise tolerance, inability to perform ADLs. Now we will be dividing in two. Just one sec, I'll uh, do it again, slide. Just one sec, I'll try to share the slide again. Slide was not visible. Yes, sir. Slide wasn't visible. No, no. Okay, just a minute. Just one
Now is this visible? No, not visible. Okay. Okay, just a minute. Give me two minutes time. Problems you find in the cardiothoracic patient and then according to that, you uh, try to manage the symptoms. Next. Yeah, so I have divided these goals into two, go two terms, like two kind of terms so that it will be very easy for you to understand what it is and uh, uh, like the two terms, uh, like the last, like so short term goals as well as the long term goals. Short term goals, of course, to expand the less irritated lungs as well as the two clear secretions, of course, to make your patients more happier and more healthier about it. And after that, you go for the reducing work of the breathing. That's the main. Just one second. Yes, please come. Please come. So, uh, like long-term goals when it comes to uh, long-term goals are to educate patient to improve exercise tolerance as well as to improve areas as i told you you have to get the patient adjust for the uh, for the family life next slide you'll be seeing that overview of techniques based on the problems list as well as the goals so next slide you'll be seeing the uh, what all the over uh, like what all the techniques we have based on the problem list and goals Sir, you can keep nexting it, no problem. I'll be keep talking, so they'll be able to see that. Uh, lung expansion therapy techniques. You know, the, these are the main techniques I have just uh, consolidated uh, in terms like you have a very easy understanding. The lung expansion therapy techniques are given to the patients with loss of lung volumes and, and based upon level of consciousness. It includes positioning. It includes uh, breathing techniques it includes even pnf mechanical aids it includes even the cpap uses of cpap bipap etc but when it comes to the airway clearance techniques that include your traditional method your traditional method like your percussion vibration uh, shaking so these all are the method where you use as well as the autogenic drainage like more relatively more modern method like your ad autogenic drainage as well as your mechanical aids such as flutter a capella those working in hospital must be knowing about flutter and a capella we still will discussing at the end of our session like how does it do and then i'll be telling you about very small very simple technique since our physios even working in the remote part of this country so i'll be telling you very simple technique where you can increase your positive pressure as well as you can actually utilize without these apparatus also in a proper way our model is almost ready for another uh, half an hour after discussing the important part we will be going so to reduce the work of breathing, as I told you, it's a very, very important thing. So positioning, very, very important part, positioning, relaxation, as well as the breathing techniques, even of course, mechanical aids. And then I'll let you know, look, whatever the position you are seeing in the ICU, that's mainly because of the nurses do, right? You are not a part of that. You are the part for the therapeutic positioning. Therapeutic positioning is one of the most important uh, to be done by the physios and it has to be acknowledged by the other uh, health professionals. Yes, and you have to make them sure. Yes, this therapeutic technique, I mean, therapeutic poisoning is going to work for you. So next will be, uh, uh, since my screen sharing is not possible, so I will not be able to share that uh, whiteboard technique. So I have taken the whiteboard. I'll be letting you know how, I mean, how we talk about the lung volume and capacities, as you know very well, but we'll be discussing about those volume and capacities which are less spoken, less understood, and less discussed among the physios. Other uh, continued problem is progressively reduced activity, of course, because oxygen is the life and the life is, it is not there, life air is not there, of course, patient will be getting progressively weak, right? And up, apart from that, we have a therapeutic intervention for common abnormalities like tachycardia, hypertension, orthostatic hypotension, arrhythmia. So these all could be related to the gases exchange problem. Again, the controlled mobilization and work simplification for those people who actually have uh, gone for more debilitated feature in your body during course of the disease as well as the treatment. So 
Let us start lung expansion therapy. But before lung expansion therapy, I would like to I would like to talk about uh, some very very important concepts. That concept, not just talk. I will I will try to draw and ask you. Look what happened. How many of you know uh, what is collapsing pressure? Okay. Why? How do we calculate collapsing pressure? And why collapsing pressure is as important as to understand for the physio as important as doctor. So just uh, one minute, I will arrange my whiteboard and then I'll uh, try to get it done. Just one second. Please unmute, sir. Yeah. So suppose this is the bronchus. What happened here? The terminal bronchial comes right, right. Everybody agree? Yeah. And alveoli it comes right. Okay. So these are the terminal bronchials. Let us take the diameter of this bronchus, R, big R, capital R. And these are small r. What do you understand about this? If I ask you, flow of air is inversely proportional to radius, right? So if there is more radius, flow of air will be easy, right? And then resistance also will be there if there is a reduced radius, right? What I want to tell you here is, why do we say bronchial asthma? Can anybody answer me? If I ask you, where is the big radius? Where is the more radius? You will say, sir, radius is bigger here. This is very small here. Then why don't you tell bronchial asthma? And I know uh, our person, Nazir sir, uh, has been with the COVID patient. He must be understanding about it. And he has been seeing this kind of problem more. Why, do we, why don't we say that bronchial asthma? Why do we say all this bronchial asthma? Because this is small, small, small r, it doesn't matter for us. Why? Because these all are calculated. That what we say sigma in mathematics is a summation of a small, 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 all the radius. So sigma r is much greater than one small big, uh, I mean one big r. Isn't it true? So summation of all the radius of the bronchioles is much bigger than the radi radius of Bronchi, terminal bronchi. Is it clear till here? Is it clear till here? You can just give thumbs up. I have no problem. You can give thumbs up if it is clear. So, flow of air is more restricted here than these places. Your beta adrenergic, what you say that uh, beta 2 blocker, right? I'm not very good at pharmacology anymore now. But still, beta 2 blocker, uh, beta 2 adrenergic, what does it do? It works on this. It works on this. It only dilates this. And one more thing as a physio, please remember, this get constricted during the expiration, especially. So in the, what we say, uh, COPD, COPD, obstructive pulmonary disease, what happened? Breathing in is easy, breathing out is a problem. So it's a, isn't it? 
Yes, breathing out is a problem. Isn't it true? So breathing out is because of this. Now you understood? Bronchiolo bronchioles have no problem. Problem is in the bronchus. Got it? So we say bronchi bronchodilator. We never say bronchiolodilator. Do we say that? Bronchiolodilator? We never say bronchiolodilator, right? So this is the one concept I would like to understand properly. If you don't understand, again, we will be discussing. But as a physio, you must know about it. And this knowledge will get you acknowledged in the field of pulmonology, uh, pulmonology therapy. I mean, what we say, the cardiopulmonary therapist. So these small, small R is much bigger than this. So flow of air is not a problem here. Most of the problem is here. So our medicine work on here. Okay, and later part of the day when we will be discussing about the equal point pressure that will be even more interesting and clearer about it. So right now what we are talking about, I'm sure you understood this. Okay, just one sec. After doing, after knowing this, there is a concept called collapsing pressure. Why it is important collapsing pressure? What is collapsing pressure? With the pressure, any alveoli can collapse, right? So what is collapsing pressure? Uh, no problem, sir. It will not be there in the slide. I just wanted uh, to get them a feel of uh, mathematics behind it. So collapsing pressure. Collapsing pressure, generally, we calculate like this. Two into surface tension divided by radius of alveoli, right? Right? This is the collapsing pressure. Now here you see, that means if the surfactant, I mean, what you say, the surface tension is more, collapsing pressure is more, right? That means whenever we expire, we should die because of collapse, but that does not happen. Why? Because of the, there is something called the surfactant. Now in the chat box option, I want within five minutes, the name of two surfactants. From your side. So this is because of surfactants that keep, 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 keep controlling over the surface tension. Okay. Now, radius of the alveoli. Now you can easily understand. Oh, oh sir. Now I got it. Because of the cigarette, uh, in the cigarette smoker, more alveolis are damaged. Radius of alveoli has decreased because of the less expansion. So what is happening? The collapsing pressure increasing. So nearby alveoli getting damaged. True. Understood. Very, very good. Very, very good. DPC. Thank you, Ravizi. So now nearby alveoli getting damaged, right? And because of getting damaged, more and more collapsing pressure increasing, other alveolis are starting getting damaged. Now how your therapy will treat it will be coming on the slide and let you know in the lung extension therapy. So this was the second concept I wanted to know. I wanted to let you know. Third concept, concept is how about the <clears throat> dead space area. You know the basic physiology and anatomy, so I did not go to the basic. I went to the advanced to understand. How about the, uh, uh, what, what, we're, uh, what we're talking about, the pulmonary ventilation first, as well as the alveolar ventilation. I'll be taking breathing like, no, no use. Why? Because pulmonary ventilation and alveolar ventilation is totally different. Let me talk about it. There is something called dead space, right? Dead space. Two type of dead space, you know, anatomical as well as the physiological. But anatomical as well as the physiological are same for the normal people, right? Anatomical dead space where there is no gases exchange happen. Physiological dead space, when the alveolar damage happen, then only it comes into the account, right? Now, let us talk about the how do you calculate the uh, dead space? So when we calculate the dead space, we have a very uh, simple formula. Uh, <clears throat> how do we do that? We do dead space air calculation is equal to tidal volume into PaCO2 minus P big A CO2 divided by P big A CO2. Don't get confused. This is the Bohr formula. You may have seen or I don't know. So Bt is nothing. It's a tidal volume, of course. P is CO2. What happened in the artery, the, uh, sorry, the artery where the carbon dioxide is there, right? So this has been measured as six. We'll take it as a six. 
PaCO2, big ACO2. That is what it is in the in the coming out of the air. This pressure is the pressure of carbon dioxide coming in the air. Four. Generally, it is four, right? So Vg means the tidal volume. If you if you say roughly 500 ml into six minus four divided by six, that is that is about 166 ml, which is roughly 150 ml. So dead space is about 150 ml. Very very simple. Now after doing this bore calculation, let us talk about the what is the difference between pulmonary as well as the alveolar ventilation. Even though you are seeing your patient having a very good ventilation. But still, he is not able to improve. Why? Pulmonary ventilation is equal to tidal volume into the respiratory rate, right? But alveolar ventilation is equal to what? Tidal volume minus dead space air volume is equal to respiratory rate. Now you calculate pulmonary ventilation. If you take a respiratory rate, say for example twenty. If it is uh, sorry, uh, say for example you are taking as a twelve. It is a five hundred. It is a six thousand ml. Your ever your patient is able to take six thousand ml, but you are not seeing improvement. Why? Because alveolar ventilation is less. Okay, so here tidal volume five hundred minus one fifty into R R that will be coming about four thousand four thousand ml. Say for example, tidal volume five hundred minus one fifty three fifty into the twelve. So it's about four thousand two hundred. So now you saw how much it is reduced, right? So this is the usable air for your patient. This is not usable air for your patient. Clear? This mathematics is it clear? Give me thumbs up. It is clear. If if not, I'll explain it again. Fine. So you understood what is the difference between pulmonary and alveolar ventilation? Why it is so important? Now let us talk about functional residual capacity. Okay. So what is the gas? Which is remaining inside, you know. Uh, very simple. I'll ask you. Suppose this is the normal tidal volume. Okay. So how much it is the increased? You know how much on and above you can take is that is the IRV, inspiratory reserve volume, isn't it? In the combination of tidal volume, how much ever you can take it out, that is the expiratory reserve volume, isn't it? Now, whatever you are not able to take out, even with the best of your effort, that is called the RV, residual volume, and it is in such a way that it is so important. If it is not there, it is something that puncturing a balloon. If you puncture a balloon, what happens? All the air goes out, right? So this is very important. When we will be discussing in the lung therapy, there are about two pressures: intrapleural and intrapulmonary. You will come to know this. So in the later part of the day, again we will be back on the mathematics of EPP. Equal pressure point. There is a person doing research who have been discussing with me EPP, and then we found that EPP is so important concept for PGO. If they understand this, it's always good for them to improve their skills, and they know how much to do arrhythmic drainage, how much to do uh, percussion, how much to do what vibration, when to do. These all concepts you will be knowing. So let us talk about some of the more theory part. Some of more theory part, kind of, kind of, <clears throat> like the lung expansion therapy, a group of techniques, a group of techniques used to expand a collapsed lung, both in conscious and unconscious patient, is not in general termed as a lung expansion therapy. Indicate, as you know, it's a atelectasis, uh, consolidation, pleural effusion, pneumothorax following abdominal as well as the cardio, the cardiac surgery. Restrictive lung diseases. <clears throat> atelectasis. If you find atelectasis, you have a. I have attached one X-ray also. If sir can show X-ray, that's good. Otherwise, I can. You can see even on your manual also. It will be sent to you. There is an X-ray attached. There you can find the clinical sign. How it is different? Okay, uh, sir. Next slide. There is an X-ray. Let them see the X-ray. I will talk about that. Normally, clinical sign comes like medical history, like your recent abdominal or thoracic surgery, history of chronic lung disease, like cigarette smoking. You know, these all are the signs. Even the tachypnea, tachycardia. No problem, sir. I can speak. No problem. You can just uh, let them see the X-ray. They will have a look like how does it look. 
and then uh, consultation if you find bronchial bleed sound you find uh, fine and early inspiratory crackles that is something in atelectasis happens why did i uh, uh, you know gave a more importance to atelectasis because you should understand this is one of the common condition where the uh, where, where the cardio physio get confused so please don't get confused i have attached a very simple atelectic lung here please go through that and find it you will find it there is a displacement of inner lobular fissure toward the affected zone okay you will find the crowding of uh, you can say vessels what we say the bronchopulmonary vessels basically you will find the crowding of those vessels because in the affected region of course because of compression and then you find the elevation of that from on the affected site so these all are the signs while seeing the x-ray you will come to know foot foot okay fine these are all the points we can see that shift of trachea toward the affected side that is one of the chronic feature you find in this you can find even the mediastinum and hilum uh, toward the affected side you will find the shift small shift and then you will find the narrowing of space between the ribs uh, especially where the area of atelectasis wherever there is a uh, atelectic area you will find that ribs are getting contracted little bit why it is because if you know about anatomy one very good feature there is something called structure and function look however you function your structure will convert into that however you uh, however you uh, your your function is slowly your structure will get convert like that right that is how from the birds mammal came and the mammals we became and we lost everything now still the birds are flying <laughs> that is how the anatomy and physiology goes its structure and function are complementary to each other anyway now it's a matter of time evolution can take more time but maybe in the attractive feature it cannot take so long time so again so x-ray film you are well aware of this i will give you in the manual go through this but i would like to request you go to the hospital go to your opd collect some of the attractic feature and measure and find out what sir has told whether it is there one or two feature may not be there that depends upon the age of the disease but it doesn't mean that it will not happen it might happen so i have given you more clinical feature you may get even more clinical feature in some of the medicine book that's a different thing but i have given something on the basis of the day to day practical basis i mean some five or eight points you can have so now next uh, if you see in the slide also manual also will be sent to you in this you will find the mechanism of lung expansion therapy there are three mechanism basically three mechanism increasing the transpulmonary pressure improving the collateral ventilation and physiology of interdependence so you can show there yes increasing the transpulmonary pressure gradient what it is what is transpulmonary pressure the this transpulmonary gradient pressure is the difference between intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressure mind my word intrapulmonary and intrapleural pressure why i am stressing on this because if you are able to increase your tpp gradient by any which way you are a successful physio it is going to work for lung expansion how it is possible any breathing method or technique that we will discuss more than 20 breathings today <clears throat> intrapleural pressure is mostly negative as you must have been knowing and throughout the inspiration as well as the expiration but uh, if you talk about the negativity as you know negative negativity may be because of two factors first factor is elastic recoiling of the lung tries to pull the viscera visceral pleura also inwards and second thing is the chest wall has a tendency of to expansion outward so that the pulling the parietal pleura which is adherent to the chest wall that gives them the negativity so that part is very very important it has been given in the manual please go through understand it i have given even in the picture also You can find in the picture what I have told, and you can remember, sir, I told this. And any method which can increase your TPP gradient will help you in the lung expansion. Try to understand. If you can increase the intrapulmonary pressure, if you can increase the sorry, if you can increase the de decrease the intrapulmonary pressure, gradient will increase. See the formula. Use the formula and apply on your patient. If it doesn't work, let me know. so next will be the improving collateral ventilation sir will be showing you the photo also uh, like in slides uh, photo also will be coming <clears throat> you can see that improving collateral ventilation there are the generally in, uh, you know like a inspiratory hold when you do you say your patient you say hold okay we say many patients to hold the breathing why do we say that 
because we want a collateral ventilation. Collateral ventilation happens uh, through generally three channels uh, in the respiratory pathways. That's because of channel of Martin, channel of Lambert, channel force of Korn. Force of Korn is nothing. It's between two alveolus. Just remember, channel of Martin is between the two bronchioles, two terminal bronchioles, and channel of Lambert is between the bronchus as well as the alveolus. That's it. Third part is physiology of interdependence. Look what happened in a group of alveoli have a tendency to collapse, right? I told you the cigarette smoker, I made you understand between the small r, big r, how does it work? So what then happened, adjacent expanded alveoli produces forces that tend to prevent the collapse, that tend to prevent the collapse. Since alveoli are pla placed so closely and tight pack structure, so any technique which can expand your neighboring uh, alveoli, it will also you know, uh, uh, improve your uh, alveoli, which is deeply seated and gone without gases. It may have chance to even better those alveoli. Is it understood? So these principles work properly. After that, there is a picture also given. This is for your homework. If you go there and see these pictures, it will be very good for you. Next. <coughs> Okay, so lung expansion generally we use uh, many techniques like control mobilization, positioning, breathing exercises, PNF for respiration, incentive spirometry, intermittent position, uh, positive pressure breathing. Uh, we use the positive pressure airway uh, therapy and then we use the CPP, what means CPAP, continuous positive pressure airway therapy. Administration of techniques, if you talk about administration of technique is something like lung expansion therapy techniques should be administered based on level of consciousness. Be very assured about it. Don't worry if you miss any theory part, manuals, it will be there. So don't be worried. According to the level of consciousness, please apply the lung expansion therapy. Okay. If patient is unconscious, use PNF. PNF respiration, very important concept. And that is the first one we will talk about. Then if patient is uh, not, uh, if patient is not alert, you can use IPP, no problem. If patient having problem with uh, excessive secretion, you can use the PP therapy. So you can continue going sides, no problem. If patient having a conscious and cooperative, you can go for incentive spirometry. If patient is still not resolved, what will you do? You go for CPAP. Frankly speaking, BiPAP. Today we'll talk about why is BiPAP having always upper hand than CPAP. CPAP is most commonly used uh, 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 type of uh, what to say pressure airway technique. But why do we use BiPAP? What is the use? What is the simple method which makes the very special BiPAP? So you can go ahead, no problem. Slides can go ahead, no problem. Yeah, the next part is our bronchial hygiene therapy. Very important. Bronchial hygiene therapy is the use of non-invasive airway techniques. Uh, what happened in this case, physical or mechanical means of facilitating the removal of trachea bronchial flame through the external and internal manipulation of airflow and the evacuation of flame via coughing. So bronchial hygiene therapy. This is something, yeah, slides you can see. It will be even in the manual. So normal defense mechanism. Today I'll be talking about uh, normal defense mechanism and uh, it is not there in the slide. Uh, means the, apart from normal, we'll be talking about something about COVID also. Look what happened. Normal defense mechanism, what kind of mechanism we have? We have a sneeze reflex, a cough reflex. We have a mucociliary escalator. What do we do? This is the first line of defense, right? So anything passes these layers. Which, what we say the non-specific defense mechanism counter it by phagocytosis, right? Phagocytosis. But again, through neutrophils and macrophages, it goes for complement activation. The specific defense mechanism resulting in specific immunological reaction in relation to certain antigen is formed by the antibodies. That is generally uh, IgA or maybe IgG. Or if it is a new problem, it could be IgE, eosinophil. You would have heard about eosinophilia, right? Look, before getting into normal clearance, apart from that, whatever immunity we know, apart from that, we have something called the um, mucosal immunity. You know about mucosal, what it is, what I'm talking about, mu uh, mucus, 
anybody can tell what i'm talking about mucus can you understand i'm not talking about sebum i'm not talking about anything else i'm talking about uh, mucus layer okay so right from top to bottom we have a mucosal layer right epithelial cells right we have that right even after the upper respiratory tract we have that right what happen in covid cases why do we say that if somebody has a less mucus layer he might get affected reason behind that any kind of virus no matter if the size is even smaller or bigger it always affect when there is a lack of mucosal layer okay mucosal layer lack doesn't mean that it will be totally seen from top but it could happen because of animal protein so anybody having lot of animal protein it can create problem sir you can stay there only slides can stay there only uh, i'm just talking about covid so what happen in this covid condition this gets very easily when there is a person with lot of animal protein so you know after remaining here for about two or maximum three days upper respiratory tract it doesn't give any complication covid always give complication when it travels down right and traveling down happens more and more if somebody has more animal protein they have more tendency it doesn't mean that vegetarian will not get affected it doesn't mean that but yes we have one thing to say that yes mucosa can couch if very good mucosal layer is there normally these kind of viruses either as a covid hanta or adeno or rhino any viruses this will not affect much because already you have something called the herd immunity okay since herd immunity is almost with every one of us no doubt about it so if 50% or 60% of the population has developed immunity for certain virus or bacteria especially virus let me tell you remaining population will have herd immunity so don't worry now <clears throat> if talking about covid i can tell you in our lifetime maybe once or twice covid would have come we don't know yes it is possible this is this covid is the same which you which came in 2002 as sars severe acute respiratory syndrome right sars when the covid came there was a name also sars covid 2 later they changed to covid 19 so this will keep coming this is the version of flu this is a very contagious version this is very uh, what we say aggressive version now what you see the covid i feel personally more than 15 type of genetic variation already finished means it must have attained more than 15 type of genetic variation ever since it has come from the wuhan wuhan to middle east to uh, deep west then then back to eastern part of country so i'm the genetic makeup of the coronavirus would have changed for multiple times we never know multiple times and aggressiveness also would have lost over the period of time that happens in pandemic and corona may still like an endemic what is problem no problem it can still like endemic it will not affect any more later but yes the pandemic will go down. pandemic period will go down. so that is how it happens so our immunity is so important uh next part we will uh, discuss about when we talk about the diet part how do we control these kind of viruses okay go ahead sir please next slide so yeah you can see this if you want to take a photo you can take otherwise there in your notes and manual look what happened this is the problem this is the vicious circle what happened you have a mucus plugging in your patient then there is a lung infection uh, because the mucus becomes a this the plugging becomes the bread and butter for the bacteria to develop then later inflammation happens more mucus production more lung damage again more mucus retention again go for plugging so it's a vicious circle how do you break this you have a uh, you have a interruption through various uh, method like first part is a nutrition you can interrupt you can have a anti inflammatory drug if you feel there is a uh, there is a inflammatory feature like uh, like fever like uh, like running nose those things then you can go for the bronchodilators if you feel that uh, a uh, person is not able to expire enough is not able to exhale better then you can go for the mucolytics if you feel there is a plugging already started you can use antibiotics if your blood if your patient blood test shows that there is a there is a increased amount of wbc as well as the cup what we say the sputum culture shows there is a increased bacteria you can use for the airway clearance technique so this is how you break this vicious circle this is very important to break this circle next techniques if you talk there are many traditional method like cupping huffing turning 
postural drainage, percussion, vibration, shaking, active mobilization, these all are the method traditionally we are using, right now also we are using for the airway clearance. Other newer methods like your breathing strategies, like your autogenic drainage, you can go for the ACBT, active cycle of breathing technique, FET, force expiratory technique. I'm telling you today, your concept will be changed about it. Your concept, whatever you know, why it happens, that you will come to know how it happens. You will come to know tomorrow onward after practicing, maybe after three months, you will be, you'll be knowing how much to give for whom. But these all hygiene therapy, it depends upon the age. How do we do that? We don't do for every age. Conventional though we do for every age, but uh, chest PT, we can go for zero to one year. And then we can think of blowing games like pinwheel, wheels, bubbles, these all kind of thing we can think then we can go for the HFCC ventilation for about uh, three years age. For three to four years age, you can teach cupping and huffing, no problem. They are smart enough now. For four years onward, you can go for PP flutter. You should not use these all below five years. Sorry, four years. Then five years onwards, you can go even for the ACBT techniques, no problem. You can go for the exercises part also. For 10 years onward, you can go for IPPV. 12 year onward, you should go for the autogenic drainage. Autogenic drainage is not something to be given for the kids. Okay, below 12 years, in my opinion, should not be given. Okay, yeah, slides can go further. Next part is very important is our work of breathing. So you are seeing that all the problems I'm explaining, what is the problem? Then we will go for the therapy part. So work of breathing is something, uh, definition of work of breathing. Again, it will be coming in your manual if you are, uh, if you are missing in your slide, but uh, it is there already in the slide. So, <clears throat> Uh, work of breathing is uh, can be defined as amount of pressure generated as the amount of pressure generated uh, to move the certain volume of gas but few facts you should remember look always uses up to four percent of total body consumption for the at rest for the work of breathing okay next part you should understand it is increased with the breathlessness clients can go further sir no problem work of breathing i'm discussing Work of breathing is what? It is a product of transpulmonary pressure gradient and it is a product of tidal volume, right? So if you uh, multiply tidal volume with transpulmonary pressure gradient, your work of breathing comes out. So now you tell me, if you, if you, even with the less tidal volume, if you have a better TPP, your work of breathing can be maintained. Okay, anyway, we will be discussing this even further. Work of breathing is nothing. It is something the you match the measures the balance between the energy supply and the energy demand. How the energy you can supply? You can supply through the nutrition. You can supply through the oxygen. You can supply through the uh, what we say that uh, electrolyte balance. Very important, right? Uh, you can supply through the oxygen delivery to the inspiratory muscles, right? Maybe the pranayama or maybe your IPPB or whatever the breathing techniques you use. And how to decrease the energy demand? You have given the nutritional supplement and other energy supply to the patient. Now your focus to decrease also the work by the patient so that the energy you have given work in a better proper manner. So the to decrease energy demand, what do we do? We do handling, sleep and rest, stress reduction, positioning, breathing re-education, mechanical assistance, exercise training, respiratory muscle training. Again, I'll be uh, detailing it in one minute. Yes. Look, so I told you work of breathing, it can be measured between the energy supply and energy demand. So when it comes to increase the energy supply, it is about uh, nutritional management, oxygen therapy. You can directly give the oxygen uh, uh, delivery to the inspiratory muscles and you can do the fluid and electrolyte balance. Okay, sir. Okay. Then to decrease the energy demand, you have a lot of method to decrease the energy demand. How do you do that? You can go for the handling, you can go for the sleep and sleep and rest, you can go for the stress reduction, you can you can you can actually go for the 
positioning, you can go for the breathing re-education, you can go for the exercise training, you can go for the inspiratory muscle training. Why do I am saying this? Because the energy supply, whatever you give, then you want your patient to use that. Then you want your patient to conserve the energy given to him for better improvement, right? That is how we work. So work of breathing is always a balance, is a always a proper strategy you should have, how you are giving the energy and how you are able to conserve that and you are able to improve your patient with different other lung therapy and bronchial hygiene therapy. Okay, thank you. Just one sec. I'll share it again. Screen. Just one minute. I'll share it again. The screen. Yes, sir. Please. Uh... Yeah, I'm sharing, sir. I'm sharing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any question? Any doubt? Yeah. Anyone has any doubts? Yeah. You can post in the chat box. Meanwhile, you can post in the chat box because I have discussed a lot of mechanical mathematics behind the thing. So, please post it. Please enable me in the screen setting. So you can share anything. You can share now. Please enable me. Yeah. Sir, you can only do that. You are the host. You have to do... You are the host. Can you do that? I'll just see this. I'll just go to the participants. But, uh, host disabled attendee screen setting. No, no, no. You must, Saurabh Sandilya, you select the co host. Go to the participants and. No, in the laptop, in the laptop. 
go to your laptop please call me yeah select the participants from there yes sir i'm trying sir Yes, I'm selecting it, sir. One minute. By the time the participants can uh, post their questions, anybody. So it's happening? Sharing? Yeah, I'm trying, sir. Just one second, it will happen. I'm not getting your voice. It will happen in one time. Okay, okay. Just I'm trying that uh, downloading.
happening sir yes sir 5 minutes it will be done it needs only pdf version that is the reason it's not coming just one second and give two three minutes breaks to all Uh, lab classes so <clears throat> uh, just before uh, going for the lab classes we have two minute discussion about that uh, techniques of reducing the work of breathing handling breathlessness people how do you do that communication should be very clear especially with the language problem we should be very very aware about it and then basically and then <clears throat> we have to ask the close ended question rather than a open question those who are uh, neuro background from the cardio background they'll understand better and those who are a student they must practice the uh, they must practice the what we say a close ended question close ended question is always good either you want or not okay like that. so sleep and rest very 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 important positioning as i told you therapeutic positioning relaxation work of breathing uh, Breathing techniques to you. Uh, what all techniques you can uh, 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 use to reduce the work of breathing is about breathing control technique, innocenti technique, first sleep breathing. We'll be discussing about it. Avoidance of breath holding, using a pen that is supposed to influence the receptors in basically trigeminal nerve. That pro that distribution that provides the information to sensory cortex to calm down, and then mechanical vibration of our chest is also seen to reduce the breathlessness. self acupressure on any of the following point like uh, anterior midline between the nipples of uh, first and fourth uh, at level of fourth intercostal space then just below the each coracoid process and one and half thumb with lateral to lower border of each p3 spinous process so these all are the self acupressure point can be told to the to the uh, uh, attendees attendants whoever near to the patient now <clears throat> with this we will be starting our uh, like a therapeutic body positioning how do we do that so uh therapeutic body positioning uh, i'll be uh, telling you something again uh, of course basic then advanced and then of course related to covid also so be prepared uh, and give me 2 minutes time i'm sitting uh, my model also has come so i'm setting it for the lab class uh, we'll go go for the lab and then and uh, there we'll spend about 2 hours so there will be no break for another 2 hours Uh, yeah 2 minutes time i am switching off my video and then getting it done for the uh, my coach side yeah prepare for the coach part yeah come to the coach that side that side
yeah so we are all set so we'll be talking about it now model will introduce himself he's working with me he'll introduce and then uh, we'll start <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Das Mato. I'm a physical therapist working with Sour Doctor. That's it. Today, I'm demonstrating the cardio pulmonary technique breathing exercise. Sour will be demonstrated. Is able to see me. Is everyone able to see me? Give it thumbs up. Everyone is able to see? Yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. Okay. Fine. What I was talking about therapeutic body positioning, this is something very, very important. Why? Because, say for example, it is an, of course, non-invasive intervention that can augment the arterial oxygen. But how does it do that? Routine body positioning is done by the nurses. Mechanical body positioning, also called the kinetic therapy, is performed to prevent the respiratory complications such as ventilator associated pneumonia, as you know very well. Amps of positioning are a lot. You can go through the manual and you know very well. Then positioning to address the dyspnea. High side line, high side line, forward lean seating, relaxed seating, forward lean standing. Relaxed standing, stride standing, kneeling, especially children. Occasional poison like you're uh, lying flat, uh, lying flat, or some patients like even, uh, you know, uh, slightly uh, head down tilt, those kind of poison also can be common. So what I'm showing you only one poison here. Uh, I have given the mechanism of all poisons. So I'll be dealing you uh, like one poison I'm showing you for the asthma. Other things you can uh, go through this and then just uh, let me, uh, maybe you can post in the questions. Okay, I have given the importance of supine line, side line, prone line, and then of course, how everywhere the blood get distributed. Suppose he is an asthmatic case. Yeah, you can just slide out. You can remove yourself if you want. Yeah. Better to remove your shirt. saying here the patient whoever is lying like this what do we do with them we try to give them we try to bend their knee and and keep the pillow or roll towel or the kind of bolster below his knee why did we do like this you can just uh, camera is focused you can just see that why did we do like this? Anybody has any question? I mean, anybody has any clue about it? Uh, flexing. The, yes. Flexing the knees uh, causes posterior tilt of the pelvis that relaxes abdominal muscle. Yes. Yes. So that, uh, exactly. So that decreases that decreases exertion over the lung area, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So this is how uh, we have to have a position like this. Now in the picture, you can see, I have given basically four mechanical joints of the lung, okay? So it's a John one, John two, John three, and John four. When you go through the manual, you'll find that basal area has more blood flow and top area has less blood flow, but predominantly most patients, they breathe through the apical area, apical 
says and uh, basically apical low okay and then of course fourth joint i have not listed yet that's mainly because that has relatively no blood flow it's uh, it's related to the diaphragm so uh, next part you can see positioning in restrictive lung disorder how do we do that pleural effusion always side lying with affected side suppose this person has affected side uh, like uh, this is the affected side i do one thing i'll uh, i'll just uh, i'll just give a black mark so that you can understand better so okay so black mark i have given mainly to see that it is a affected site so is there any affected site pleural effusion cases we try to make the patient lie down on the same site <coughs> i'm sorry uh, i'm talking about the the uh, sorry i'm very very sorry just because any kind of surgery before going to the affected site up position that is the major rule bad lung up rule what happened here we try to make the patient lie down on the same side for few days why because we want all the intercostal drainage to get assist with the gravity okay otherwise bad lung up rule is something common okay why because if it is a pneumothorax lying on the good side is comfortable with mainly because of ventilation for fusion ratio is quite optimal and lying on the affected side may speed up the absorption of air when it is coming to the bronchic cases leg end is often elevated as i told you in earlier case also with affected side uppermost bilateral cases uh, should not to uh, should do better with the supine line but always remember bad lung up rule exceptions of course recent recent surgery like this recent pneumectomy large pleural effusion bronchopulmonary fistula a large mainstream uh, bronco uh, bronchopulmonary what we say bronchus tumor so these all are the problem where we have a where we have a, a, like a, we have exception we don't put the bad lung up otherwise mostly uh, in those cases initially for few days we always keep the bad lung down because we want intercostal tube to be drained along with the gravity that is the major thing so as i told you in asthma or any kind of copd how do we do that and one person also told like how it is possible to keep a pillow below the knee okay now the next part we'll go to the pnf respiration you can find in the uh, slide also pnf respiration you can you can be in supine line please it was started by uh, it it was started in canada 1975 uh, after a lot of research that es pnf respiration can be applied the uh, the rationale behind it like monotonous or shallow respiration leads to attack cases and retention of secretion so lack of muscle tone leads to deranged mechanical respiratory dysfunction so how uh, like what do we do we try to apply externally <clears throat> proprioceptive and tactile stimulus that produces the reflex respiratory movement response that alter rate as well as the depth of the respiration as i told you you have to use these techniques in in the uh, uh, in the unconscious patients but don't use these things for child though there is one method of pnf respiration the most common is you use your male space and take the intercostal uh, part here what we say the costo prana angle and then you keep your hand like this and you while patient is normally inspiring expiring inspiring expressing you give a proper downward and lateral stretch and then relax you give downward and lateral stretch and then relax i am saying you the most common type you start from the center then slowly you go to the other parts of the diaphragm because you know the diaphragm is a dome shaped muscle so slowly you go simply but here in your manual i have divided it into some seven types in this seven types only one type is the first one perioral pressure that can be given to the child 
but still i say people to stay away for doing for the child okay other methods will be discussing one by one so this is the most common method what i showed you okay <clears throat> let us talk about the perioral stretch okay perioral stretch is nothing is a applying firm sustained pressure on the upper lip how do we do that i am focusing it let us see that I am showing you from my other hand. Generally, it is the right hand I have to do so that you can see it. Upper lip, go to the upper lip and apply the proper pressure, firm pressure on the upper lip. Okay. Just uh, you will find that some uh, three to five seconds of apnea, then epigastric excursion, deep breathing, mouth closure. Uh, and swallowing what uh, the pediatric physiotherapy we see that uh, we say that uh, snout phenomena that happens that's mainly because of a primitive reflex nothing else primitive reflex related to sucking breathing swallowing so those things so we use that uh, particular uh, uh, part of stretch particular kind of uh, pnf things we are using now intercostal stretch applying pressure on upper border of lower rib in order to stretch the in order to stretch uh, the intercostal muscles in downward direction okay it is only intercostal stretch remember what i showed you the first it was a general method now i am showing you one by one which you can even specify going to the patient in <coughs> in the uh, unconscious stage how here you come upper border of lower rib you have to give the stretch okay you have to give a stretch like this two finger that's enough okay like this so gradual increase in respiratory movement area under and around the stretch you will find once you give the stretch downward you will find that there is a movement in that area okay through intercostal stretch receptor it is supposed to happen if you go to the manual vertebral high nothing else here pressure your own pump pressure how do you do that you go take it uh, you you actually find it where is the c7 then you come to the t1 then come to the t2 so roughly from the t2 to t5 you keep your hand like this and try to give the try to give the manual pressure okay that is the type what we say manual vertebral pressure high and the same thing you have to do it t7 to t10 that we say manual vertebral pressure low okay then there is something called maintained okay whoever is not able to see uh, the practical part please come uh, please keep your gadget closer i am trying to keep it as close as possible okay i'll increase some lighting also is it visible is it visible if you are not able to see uh, any other screen apart from the sharing you go to the video and then see my rehab academy's uh, screen you can put it even the speaker view okay you can put in your gadget the speaker view if you are on laptop if you put the speaker view it will come so moderate manual pressure how do we do that mild pressure of open hands over the area where the extension is needed okay say for example if somebody has a problem in this side of the lobe what is the left lobe okay left lower lobe 
what do you do open hand over the area you are keeping the pressure you are giving the pressure okay you are giving the pressure for few second this is supposed to be a uh, get performed by cutaneous reflex okay and then you relax you find increased excursion on the area of contact yes then you go for co contraction of abdomen i am telling you these all are the advanced method of pnf what i showed you the general method now this is the advanced method advanced method what happens we try to go more specify for the patient okay so how do we do that <clears throat> co contraction of abdomen placing one hand on the patient uh, lower lip lower lip my hand lower lip and and one pelvis on the same side so i'll see like this okay so basically i want to stretch this area side abdomen how do we do that we are applying the patient right angle like this the downward we are giving the pressure okay so this is something called the co contraction of abdomen what is the use use is the increased epigastric excursion rectus abdominis con contraction decrease the girth in obese patient on the bed ridden okay generally abdominal stretch receptor what for okay anterior stretch basal lift placing hand under the posterior ribs of spine and superiorly you have to gently upward you have to move it gently up up like this like this like this few seconds like this few seconds so this is how dorsal root mediated intersegmental stretch receptors in <coughs> in the intercostal and back muscles work for this so after this sit down after this pn of part we will go for the breathing exercises breathing techniques or exercises whatever you say i'll focus again you know this breathing techniques and exercises are uh, very uh, like a common right from the day one we are using <clears throat> so now slowly I was talking about that time the positioning before the PNF. I forgot uh, to speak about this. Uh, what we say, uh, COVID. That not just COVID. Any of the case, if you use the prone ventilation, what happened? The mechanical ventilation in 1970s came more, and then people uh, started leaving their manual technique. So if you do the prone, you know what is the prone ventilation? If you see the videos of. Uh, very famous uh, personalities like uh, dr vishnu choudhary and those people they actually still stress over the prone ventilation what is happening in the prone ventilation when you are doing the prone ventilation there is a proper oxygenation oxygenation always increases and according to the research up to 20% of oxygen saturation can increase when it is a prone ventilation so prone ventilation is something very very important so again we will be discussing about it later <clears throat> so right now we will be starting the breathing techniques and exercises it has been given in your manual there are two types of uh, breathing exercises one is the inspiratory another is the expiratory inspiratory as well as the expiratory we have to be focused what our patients want and accordingly we have to do it you can see in your manual first thing is coming the deep breathing deep breathing make the patient to uh, sit and uh, or uh, attain any position which is a relaxing position remember three things deep slow and long that breathing has to be done through the nose and it has to be sigh out through the mouth the most simplest what happen here generally it uh, through the nose it humidifies the air but it doubles the resistance so inspiration is always slow to decrease the velocity of the air and increase the strength of muscle of contraction okay muscle contraction whichever muscle is actively involved in this necessarily involved into it accessory muscle come later into the picture okay inspiration <coughs> uh, sorry expiration is through the mouth to keep airway open patency of a small airway closer if they do it from the expression from the uh, uh, like uh, uh, through the mouth 
that happens and that actually have a potency to keep the airway open you will come to know this thing even better in the forced expiratory technique when we will be talking about it okay diaphragmatic breathing look diaphragmatic breathing use many more pillows here i have a couch which is little lying one so make the patient uh, what we say uh, semi lying position that is how we have studied right since our second year but it's not just semi uh, uh, semi lying okay here our main focus is the diaphragm so in the semi lying position we always say patient to keep the hand over here or we keep our hand here if not possible to we keep, uh, we tell the patient to keep the one dominant hand over his diaphragm and we use his visual uh, visual stimulus to find out i'll take the question yeah we tell the patient to have a slow long normal breathing and see your hand see your hand okay so movement of the hand gives the feel of that the air is gushing in that is how it works but i am telling you it is not limited only and only to so, uh, this uh, semi lying position this breathing definitely can be done in other position also and semi lying position being the most basic position second position is the side lying position so please come to the side lying position and show the participants like how how do you do that the same thing yeah look relaxed relaxed lying relaxed lying means one uh, one leg will be kept over the will be kept over the either towel row or the pillow always is a good if it is a small pillow okay patient is totally lying then he'll be keeping his hand over here and please do that breathing in and out he can easily wash from here okay and this is how the progress of diaphragmatic breathing happens i don't know how many of you know about it but this is something happen so after semi lying go to the side lying please come and stand then the next is the relaxed standing uh, how you have to do it okay please come i'll show you how he'll be doing for the relaxed also standing how do you do the relaxed standing like a pocket how do you keep your hand in the pocket like this yeah please follow this keep in the pocket keep in the pocket so when patient is able to walk in the hospital corridor that time you should do this breathing like this you see okay no go near the wall easy no go near the wall yes and keep your hand like this okay see he is how nicely he is standing near the wall my wall is yellow color you can see okay he is standing near the wall and nicely he is watching his diaphragm or feeling it is working for him did you get my point diaphragmatic breathing is no more related to no more only limited to uh, what we say that only semi uh, what we say supine lying okay what is the uh, semi lying position right semi lying position it's not limited up to that it's, it it is progress to the side lying what i showed you and the next is the relaxed standing please come on the bed for next have any doubt anybody have any doubt anyone no sir so was it clear ravi yes sir yes. yeah so always remember the this uh, breathing are not uh, just limited to the semi uh, like semi lying it is actually it is much more that okay deep diaphragmatic breathing is there it's nothing it's just a combination of deep breathing as well as the diaphragmatic breathing now this is something now it's getting interested now and respiratory technique please try to understand anyway it will be in the manual but if you understand today you'll have opportunity to ask question you can post or post even later but now it's a different interaction so uh, yeah please uh, have a relaxed sitting it can be administered with a deep breathing to further stress on inspiration what is happening here you see <clears throat> any region of the lung which has a partial obstructed airway or decreased compliance alveoli will fill at slower 
rich. Say for example, he is a cigarette smoker. What actually he is not. So cigarette smoker, his lower lung, especially the right lung, uh, lower lobe, is having a less breathing capacity. So definitely, these kind of people, you can't expect the same kind of air filling uniformly. This part will have less speed of air filling. So what do we do? We try to tell these people to spend more time with air, whichever has been taken in. I mean to say, holding the breath. Holding the breath always make these people better. Okay. Though it is not suitable for the breathlessness kind of case like dyspnea cases, but still for normal, uh, whoever comes to your uh, uh, clinic in general in cardiac, uh, in, sorry, in pulmonary rehabilitation, you can must try that. If you remember what I told you, physiology of interdependence that works on this. Okay. <clears throat> Sniff. Oh, sorry. I did not show you that. Okay. Just take a deep breath in, hold it, now slowly relax. So in one series, you can go for nine times. Okay. In one series, you can go for nine times. In general, for the basic patient, I mean the normal patients. Now there is something called SNP. Nothing. The same thing. Here what is happening? Take a deep breath. Okay. And at last you sniff for three times. Okay. So, and then you exhale in a proper manner. Then normal, progressively you go ahead. Slowly you go ahead. So what do we do? We try to give a force at last so that some, uh, what we say, physiology of interdependence becomes even more active. The deeply seated, non-working alveoli also come into the picture. As simple as that. Now, what do we say? These all breathings are for the initial phase. When he is at home or she is at home, in that case, reduce the sniff over the period of time. So, collateral circulation, if you remember, remember like uh, channel of Martin, channel of Lambert, force of Korn, these all get activated with this. Okay. Now, there is something called seismental exercise. Seismental exercise is given to the increased localized expansion of the lung. Generally, chest wall fibrosis, pain, muscle guarding, after surgery, atelectasis, pneumonia, that all created situations where we, where we find the situation of the hypoventilation. So what do we do here? Here, if I show you this, if you do on the chair, is always good because more height is not good to give. So please come on the chair and give you one chair. Here. Go to the right side of the patient. Go to the right side of the patient. Okay. Go to the, uh, what we say that uh, uh, generally this uh, technique is important for lower and lateral lobe. So go there and hold this part like this. Tell the patient to breathe in. Okay. At the end, give downward and laterally three to four stretches. And then tell the patient to expire. Excel. Yes. At the end of expression, again, give a small stretch. Again, go, breathe in. At the end of inspiration, give up three to four to further add. And then exhale. Very good. Relax. This is how the sentimental breathing has to be done. Near to end of inspiration, if you apply three to four gentle stretches, this actually, uh, what we say, uh, stresses. Uh, you know, further more on the inspiration. That is how we want to make our own activity more, uh, what we say, our own exercise, we want to make it more effective. That is the reason.
okay but there is a problem with this technique technique is what it's like a intrapleural pressure generally get uh, uh, decrease at certain point okay so you have to be very careful any patient came after the surgery after five or six days when you are doing this don't give stretches more okay give the stretches as much as you feel comfortable and during the uh, you will see that uh, you know like a, there is a drop in intrapleural pressure that is how you try to attend with the stretches intrapleural pressure you want to reduce reduce means what you increase the uh, positivity okay anyway it's in minus so if it is a uh, say for example minus 10 you are bringing it to minus 8 so what is happening tpp if you remember the formula trans pulmonary pressure gradient that increases so that will help you in expansion of the lung okay manual cues like a vibration okay like a vibration vibration is something like this if you remember anyway i'll be discussing that vibration or pressure sensation also important you can uh, use these all for the expansion okay i always say people to go for the unilateral chest expansion exercise so that the gold, uh, shoulder girdle can rest adequately and do not tend to exaggerate movement of upper chest three type of segmental breathing exercise like apical lateral and posterior basal expansion exercise so as i told you apical is very easy to do posterior lateral is uh, lateral and posterior basal is very very important to do when it is uh, unilateral it's very easy for you to hold the shoulder and do it if it is a bilateral do it for the both side at a time no problem but remember where you have to give a stretch remember how you have to give gentle stretches don't give any stretch which is little harsh to the patient i'm telling you this is going to harm them suppose a osteoporotic lady if you are doing like this you can break the ribs don't do that then after that, it comes the stake breathing. You can come here and can show your face. Stake breathing. How the name is suggesting the stake breathing. Here, in this type of breathing, is something you are slowly getting into the area of more specificity. Means you are now being more specific to the advanced level of physical therapy. How? only breathing exercise okay where we have more inspiratory efforts than the single expiratory effort okay in this technique what is there subject breathing three to four times without express okay why why are we doing like this we are doing this mainly because we want to stack the we want to stack the higher amount of air okay it is very good to achieve the laryngeal control because every after every type of stacking there is a closure of glottis you see how it happens what you have to do you have to take a normal breath after that stop again take some amount of air then stop again take some amount of air then stop okay three times you take it please do it see stop take it stop don't expand take it stop slowly release the air okay so these breathing technique if you are doing for your uh, patient i am telling you it is going to increase the inspiratory effort of the patient as well as it is going to work for their laryngeal control laryngeal control is very very important very few physios uh, always uh, stress on that they feel that laryngeal control okay fine that that is not part of your uh, business anymore. I mean, that is not part of your thinking. But laryngeal control is equally important. So I told you to take a normal breath, then close the glottis, then take some breath, close the glottis, take some breath, close the glottis, take some breath, stop it. Slowly exhale. It is very good to have laryngeal control. Next is the slow maximal inspiration. Okay. Here, what you have done in the straight breathing, the same thing has to be done. Take a small breathing, I mean, sorry, take a normal breathing, wait, continue taking breathing. Yeah. So here, what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to do, I am not telling him to wait. Why? If you tell him to wait, then again, his glottis will be closed. I don't want glottis to be closed. 
for better laryngeal control uh, what we say that uh, apart sorry apart from the laryngeal control recruiting other muscle fibers slowly we want to recruit all the other muscle fibers look dear participant it must have been looking very easy but if you feel the if you find the patient like this you know if you find the patient like this where you need to do a lot of pulmonary rehabilitation in that case slow maximal inspiration is one of the best inspiration to start after that only you can go for the step breathing what are you trying to tell him you are telling him to go for breathing slowly and then come this is as good as like to deep breathing but here you know how much to tell in deep breathing we have no limit it is up to the normal patient but here we limit the patient okay fine till here you stop because in this case glottis is open air is free to move so what is happening it actually increases more uh, recruitment to all muscle fibers next is the sustained maximal inspiration it is one of my uh, you can say that uh, more uh, uh, talked and uh, well discussed topic here what is happening in sustained mechanical uh, uh, inspiration it is a slow deep inhalation from the functional residual capacity up to the total lung capacity followed by 5 to 10 seconds of breathing hold patient keeps glottis open so air can continue moving it involves recruitment of all laryngeal muscle fibers both these techniques can improve the <coughs> ppp gradient thereby increasing the lung expansion what is happening here we how do we do practically you see we tell the patient to breathe in normally breathe out breathe out as much as you want as much as you can in fact okay from there you breathe in. so from there he has to breathe till total lung capacity from frc to total lung capacity hold there for 5 to 10 seconds then tell him to expire the air so when he is uh, exhaling the air that time think about the pressure intrapulmonary pressure and intrapulmonary pressure what is happening you are increasing intrapulmonary pressure or uh, you are decreasing intra, uh, what we say that uh, while uh, uh, coming from frc to tlc means the functional residual capacity to total lung capacity in this case what is happening you are trying to increase the component of ppp once the ppp is increased yes things are done your lung expansion is better do you know incentive spirometry works on this principle Incentive spirometry works on this principle. Now the next is glossopharyngeal breathing. Glossopharyngeal breathing, as also known as the frog breathing, frog breathing. Okay, it is not indicated in all the subjects. It is indicated in mostly the spiral injuries, paraplegias, quadriplegias. Okay, subject. In this case, what happened? So the just take it out your box and show the glossopharyngeal breathing. In this, what is happening? You have to take what? First, mouth is closed. Okay, uh, like uh, then you open your mouth. You take several gulps of air. Ah, like that. Okay, close your mouth. Push the air back. Okay. So, say for example, and breathe out. So, say for example, every gulp is a very big person. He can take only seventy to eighty mL of air. Okay. So, <clears throat> what is happening? Five to six times, I am telling him to gulp the air so that he is building up his uh, what is say effectiveness to have more and more gulp of air, have a better inspiratory reserve volume. Okay, uh, inspiratory uh, volume, and then uh, it increases the depth of inspiration slowly. And uh, vital capacity, and then peak expiratory flow will come later in the picture. Why? Because he is such a weak person, he can't take more air at a time. So what we are trying to do? Take a gulp of air five times. Yeah. Now close your mouth, push the air back slowly. Come. Okay. So very weak person, you must try this. Abdominal breathing, very very important. Okay, here again I'll be detailing with the some of the background, but heat is the only expiration uh, breathing exercise where expiration is done first followed by inspiration. Always remember, very very important. Okay, 
generally with the paralytic subject or the diaphragmatic uh, uh, weakness these kind of people they have the good abdominals so we are using abdominals for that okay as i told you expression is done first then the inspiration now we will be seeing how it is possible in the board is there everyone is able to see that is the normal diaphragm i am telling you okay what happened in these patients this is the ribs okay these patients i am telling you they have a good abdominals right rectus abdominis transversus abdominis right so what is happening here when they contract their abdomen that pushes the abdomen uh, this uh, diaphragm up that you agree right this pushes diaphragm up up to some unusual level okay say for example this is the level this is the level it has come okay so what happened when there is a inspiration after that diaphragm diaphragm passively push down get down right it is getting downward up to the level and every time it is uh, say for example 5 to 10 percent it creates more space for the lungs okay so every time it is producing greater tidal volume got my point what is happening here muscle contraction increases the abdominal pressure right this pressure pushes the diaphragm much more much more than it can push for normal time so this is where the expiration <clears throat> accessory muscles can assist with this inspiratory effort to produce the greater tidal volume because when the suppose when the expiration is finished then what will happen inspiration will happen right so even accessory muscles like uh, trapezius like a scalene all these muscles what it does it also come in the picture and having better effect on the overall tidal volume so say for example every time it is a 5 to 10% extra of the tidal volume it amounts much more for the patient being on the bed so for the bed ridden paralytic patient spinal injury patients this is one of the best exercise i always believe did you get my point or not okay now this is something related to uh, what i wanted to say you uh, abdominal breathing there is one more breathing i'll just see whether it's the next one yes air shift breathing i'll make you explain that also just one thing the air i told you abdominal breathing that works in such a way that uh, actually make the diaphragm to go on energetically at high level and after that whenever there is an inspiration that becomes more uh, air inside the lung cage but there is one more breathing after this that we will uh, try even on that model also there is something called air shift maneuver okay air shift maneuver try to understand if you remember your uh, physiology the diaphragm is here and the lung comes like this okay diaphragm is here so what is happening here in air shift maneuver there was two things you study you know pump handle movement and bucket handle movement very popularly so pump handle movement for the longitudinal part and bucket handle movement for the horizontal basically right 
so these kind of patient who are on the bed for very very long time they lose uh, their uh, what we say that lateral movement much why because of the intercostal stiffness and uh, <clears throat> here what happen uh, they uh, have a closed glottis and then relaxing diaphragm to the individual to move air upward i'll tell you how it happens subject who all are in the supine line for very very long time and that too due to weakness they are keeping the mouth open they take deep breath <clears throat> and hold okay dear how do we do that suppose the new air has come okay through the patient uh, mouth okay we say the patient to you will write air press air then we tell the patient to close the mouth okay close the glottis okay and we say patient to do abdominal contraction relaxation contraction relaxes dear participant as i told you the airway out is blocked by the patient i have told to block so what will happen the contraction and relaxation of the abdomen will push the air for uh, that side and then it will start pushing that side also because there is nothing to go out okay just like a balloon so what is happening it is actually hitting towards the side so this is one of my favorite breathing for anybody lying on the bed for very very long time for your bed ridden patient please use this this is going to work for your bed ridden patient now this is the mathematically i have shown you systematically i have shown you now i will be showing you on the patient then you will understand even better and one more thing uh please attend and then at last i'll be asking question i'll see that how many of you have understood the concept really yeah lie down please I'll I'll focus the camera and then you can see what I'm saying. You these kind of patient who all are uh, lying down since very very long time due to their ailing condition of uh, paralysis, uh, maybe mostly uh, paraplegia or quadriplegia or uh, like they are not. So in that case, how can you uh, do the breathing part? Improvement. I'll show you. Look here. Take the deep breath in. Stop and hold. after holding do contraction and relaxation contraction and relaxation of your abdomen what is happening mouth is closed no air is moving out i told him to take deep breath in close the glottis and start contraction and relaxation of his abdomen so what will happen the air will go it will push the sideward also so it will improve the gaseous exchange as well as it improves the more and more non aerated space of the lung that is how this breathing is one of the you know this breathing is one of the best breathing you can use for your patients whoever has a uh, paralytic condition or you can see that uh, especially a c3 to c uh, c3 to c7 or even till t4 injuries whoever has this is one of the best one of the best breathing exercise for them is it clear give me thumbs up if you have understood it thank you so thank you thank you so much now next is something what you know chest mobility exercise chest mobility breathing exercises is a uh, is a kind of uh, you know like a different kind of exercise that combine active movement of the trunk and extremities with deep breathing okay here what happened you maintain or improve the mobility of the chest wall trunk and shoulder girdles when it affects the ventilation or postural alignment how do we do that <clears throat> especially after icd removal we try to do this why because we don't want our uh, things to be uh, getting closed okay fine please sit down Come to the chair. 
should I assist you or you will be able to do yourself? I will show you how to do it. Okay. Okay. So everyone, you can uh, you can face the side. They can see better. Huh? Better, better. Come back. Come back. Come back. Come back. Even more. Yes. 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 So just show them how to do it. I will show you. I will tell you how to do it. Generally, in this condition, let us start. Uh, say, for example, for forward. Okay. Okay. How do you do it? I'll show you, or I'll only do it for you. Wait. I only do it. Do like this. Okay. Bring both the hands. Okay. Now, what is your concern? You see, the starting position is that. Okay. Now I'll be telling you. Okay, I'll be telling you. Yeah. Now, take a deep breath in and out. Yeah. Before starting, always have a two or three deep breathing in and out. Yeah. Now we know. Now take the deep in. And move down. Breathe out. Yes. Okay. Breathe in. Out. Okay. This is the second day you start. First day you don't do that. Like this. Sit like this. Okay. Now, in this case, what you have to do, uh, what you did till now, it was basically for the pectoral stretches and. Uh, now what you have to do the unilateral you have to do. okay suppose again i'll give the mark better you will understand which side is affected suppose this side is affected for the fish just for your reference and you this this particular side is affected for the fish. Okay, how do you do that? So for him, that side is affected. I will tell him, keep the hand like this. Like this. See the hand position. Okay, keep the hand like this and expand that structure during inspiration going to the side. Okay. This is the starting position. What my point? And now come to this side, now uh, this uh, problem side, wherever you have keep the twisted hand and expire the air. Come. Yes. So first breathe in, breathe out. Yes. Now you got it. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So you saw that this problematic side has to be done during the inspiration, starting position, and then during expiration, it has to be done. Got my point? Did you get? Okay. Yeah. Because the next exercise you have to again close. So these are the two methods. Third method is again come to the side, there is. Okay, third method is what I told you the second one, no, like uh, keeping the uh, keeping this part and then going down. Third method is nothing. You tell the patient to in, uh, keep the shoulder at about uh, 170 degree if they can do it, but don't do it in the bypass surgery. Anybody has, but do it for uh, anybody who doesn't have a millimeter shoulder. Up, bring the hands up, both. Yes. So now what happened, breathe in and then while breathing out, he will go down. You see. And this is always better if you do on a chair. I'm telling you this is always good, safe for the patient, easy for you to, to get it. Hope it is clear. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this particular thing, you can actually get it done even without uh, what that, uh, if patient is uh, having a very good, uh, what we say, uh, if patient is having a very good uh, 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 improvement, then within seven days you can go for the wind exercise. Okay, 
uh, vent exercise, I mean to say that you can use uh, some of the rod also for that. I'll show you the vent exercise, but before that, uh, I'll tell you. Before that, the fourth thing is, you please stand up. Yeah. So what happens when the patient progresses, you go for the standing exercise. Okay. Yeah. Bring your hands up. And in this case, you can go down. Okay. Again, breathing in. Breathing in. Go down. Breathing out. Breathing out. Like this. So this is the fourth thing. Fifth thing, generally, on the bed we do it. That I'll show you just a minute. Before that, I'll show you the band exercise. How do you do that band exercise? Just, just one minute. Same thing. You see, same thing. Yeah, uh, hold always like this. Yeah. Same thing. You have to breathe in and breathe out. Take a stick and take the uh, uh, make the patient practice like this. What, why did we do with the band? You see, because this is having again a visual combination, and it tells the patient whether your rod is straight or not. If rod is straight, both hands will be in the straight manner. But before starting the band, uh, sorry, the band exercise, you can do. If your patient is still weak, you can try that. I'll tell you what to try. See, only the internal and external rotation you try. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. After that, you can go for the normal flexion. Coming, coming back. Hope it is clear. Okay. After that, there is uh, something called the chest exercise. These things you can write from the bed. You can start. How will you do on the bed? Bed, just same thing. If you remember COPD, what I told you that uh, to keep the pillow below the uh, patient's knee. In that case, what happened? In, in this uh, expansion case, what happens? Uh, generally, we try to tell the patient to pull the leg. That's it. Nothing else. Just like uh, some yoga pose. That's it. But most of the patient who comes to you after the uh, uh, recover from the surgery, they can actually do what I'm saying you right. right. They can do that. No problem. They can do it easily. Okay. Now there is something on the belt, belt exercise. I would like to see you the belt exercise when he's sitting on certain height. Reason behind, I want you to be very clear about this concept of the belt exercise. Just sit down here on the belt. Okay. You take belt or you take a towel also. Thin towel or thick towel or whatever. Whichever is easy for your patient. First, I'll tell you for the unilateral posterior basal exercise. Okay. Hold it. Yeah. If it is a unilateral, say for example, this part, as I told you, is affected for him. No, just, just this part is affected for him, this side. So this side, what he will do, he will hold it. Any of the side, whichever he feels, then he can keep it like this and then like this. Okay. In this case, what happened? If it is a unilateral posterior basal expansion exercises to be done with the bed, then breathe in, breathe out. So he has to pull his uh, during expiration. He has to pull the rolled back bed seat in the direction against the against the breathing. You see, pull. So he will be pulling that bed seat in the forward direction. This is for the unilateral basal expansion, unilateral posterior basal expansion. But when it is a unilateral lateral basal expansion, what he will do? The direction of pull will be sideward. You got my point. If it is a posterior lobe, posterior lobe has to be exercised with the basal, uh, with the expansion part. What he has to do? He has to pull the bed seat in the forward direction. But when it is the uh, uh, unilateral lateral vessel expansion exercise, he has to do it in the sideward. 
opposite to the expansion clear very clear yes so if it is a bilateral well and good he can hold both so yeah if it is a bilateral uh, a posterior vessel exercise what he has to do he has to bring it yeah breathe in breathe out so his angle of pull will be forward when it is a lateral vessel exercise pull uh, breathe in his angle will be the sideward his resistance will be the side simple if it is a lateral sideward if it is a posterior upward uh, forward so that you can resist all the time the breathing exercises you are doing this was the belt exercises as i told you now it comes to the active cycle of breathing technique yeah please active cycle of breathing technique is equally important and it's a relatively new technique and uh, this includes uh, what we say fpt post expiration technique as well as the uh, uh, it has a three phase you know very well these three phases i have been studying right since second year right yeah you know this yeah so <clears throat> three phases breathing control thoracic expansion phase and post expiration phase so in this procedure how breathing control what is that thoracic expansion what is that and then post expiratory technique you know better but i am not here to teach you those all things whatever you have studied till now i am here to say you something which is very very important the concept called equal point pressure but we will come to the equal point of pressure later first you understand what happens so me how do you do that so breathing control you take the pillow please you make your patient more relaxed you make your Make your patient more relaxed. Yeah, please make your patient more relaxed, and then tell your patient to have a normal breathing in and out. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Just like the uh, deep breathing exercises, as I have given, and then here what happened? Tell the patient to go for the more and more breathing, so that he can go for the inspiratory reserve volume area, and then of course expiration will be the positive. In this case, you can go for the percussion, vibration, those all things you can do it. But the last part is something very important. That is something called FET, post expiratory technique. It is generally the kind of hub which, uh, uh, which actually uh, kind of after one or two breathing control or hubs. Uh, there is something called the mid lung volume, low lung volume. We will come to know what it is, and that is how we feel where it is needed. We do it. So, <clears throat> just one sec. I will uh, let you know what is equal point of pressure. After that, it becomes very very easy. I will just show you about. Systematically, okay. See what happened here. Normally, what happens here? Just see that here. when the air comes in there are always two pressures right one is the pressure intra pulmonary one is the pressure intra pulmonary right now suppose someone has a uh, say for example the pressure becomes a uh, uh, alveoli pressure you are taking a very deep breath and it becomes here say for example 20 okay but after the gas is exchanged when the air is moving out okay when the air is moving out at one point of time this pressure will be this pressure equivalent right because it is a uh, uh, what we say that uh, 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 what we say say for example normal people how do we do that normal people taking the breathing say for example pressure 
and now slowly it is uh, breathing out. So don't expect it will get breathing uh, breathe out only with the pressure of 20. It cannot happen. It is not possible. So slowly it will be 18, it will be 16, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, like that and going zero and then going out. That is how it happens, right? Pressure get equalized. But you have something called the intrapleural pressure, right? So if this pressure, this pressure basically, if it goes more than this at any of this point, this will be blocked, right? Because this pressure will be more than this pressure will be blocked. How will the air go up? Generally, this get blocked here uh, in the bronchus. And in that bronchus, if the intrapleural pressure is much more also, no problem. You have a beautiful cartilages given by God. So it never collapses during the expiration, normal expiration. But when it comes to the COPD case, just a sec, I'll show you how it, how it actually works for the COPD case. COPD case is not the same story. COPD case, what happened? As I told you in earlier part of my class, sigma R, big R, right? In that case, what happened, if you see, even though it comes in a very good pressure, while going out, it loses very badly, okay? It actually loses, uh, what we say, uh, there is something called a dynamic obstruction, and, and due to the, of course, mucus plugging also, this actually, this radius gets clogged because pressure, resistance become more pressure becomes less so this pressure this point is attained much before the bronchus much before the bronchus so intrapleural pressure becomes more than intrapulmonary pressure much below the bronchus that's the reason this area goes for zero and then dynamic obstruction what we say and then this get clogged this is called equal pressure point. Equal pressure point as a PGO, you must understand and you must understand how to attain higher equal pressure point. Higher equal pressure point is always good. Okay, so in the COPD, if even they do, they do the forced expiration, this will be because of resistance, because of the uh, flow resistance, this will get equalized very, very soon. So that's the reason. We say do it, do the breathing at low lung volume that will bring the secretion into the main bronchus. Okay. And <clears throat> low lung volume means there will not be a resistance enough. Okay. If a pressure is less, no resistance enough, and with the less pressure, it will come to the main bronchus. From there, you can have one or two huff and you can remove your secretion. That is the theory of equal point pressure anybody has any doubt about it please give me the thumbs up or question or whatever you want equal point pressure hello sir is it clear hello. now sir? in the manual also it has been this particular photo has been given you can see now now you can understand this photo is very easy breathing control you are doing you are doing the thoracic expansion and then uh, based on the thoracic expansion if you don't feel there is a very good uh, huff uh, uh, like a uh, secretion can come then you can again go back to the breathing relax uh, kind of relaxation technique breathing control again you come back to the uh, thoracic expansion and then you go for the post expiratory technique uh, what we say that uh, the post expiration and huff combined with the breathing control will bring out the clock so now i have written very clearly i have typed it here a uh, huff uh, sorry, <clears throat> I have written very clearly, if you see, one or two half from the mid lung volume to low lung volume in which peripheral secretions are mobilized. So now you understood today why low lung volume and mid lung volume are important to mobilize the secretions from the terminal bronchial. And this, this particular secretion come to the main bronchus from there, you can have a very good strong pressure coming to the forced expiratory technique and you remove the tongue things from the uh, man bronchus that's very very easy but you can't try man bronchus uh, sorry the high lung high uh, lung volume breathing for the deeper deeply seated situation you need a mid or low lung volume it will reduce it will not let you attain it will not let you attain uh, uh, equal pressure point very soon so that bronchus pattern will not happen and it's easy to do that
Next is autogenic drainage. Autogenic drainage, uh, it is relatively again the new technique in, uh, it is having a two types also. One is the German method, one is the, one is the, what we say that uh, Belgium, Belgium method. It is a method of controlled breathing in which uh, patient adjust rate, location and depth of the breathing. Okay. Generally, postural drainage is given for the asthmatics to bring out secretions, produce harm rather than bringing out. So we always say autogenic drainage is better than the postural drainage. So Belgian approaches, Belgian approaches consist of three phases. You are go ahead. You are knowing and sticking, collecting, and evacuating. Again, <clears throat> again, we will be seeing how and sticking uh, that we have been uh, seeing right from the second year. But today, again, you will understand. Since now you understand the theory of ETP, equal point of pressure technique, I am telling you, you are the best in understanding now and sticking, collecting, and evacuating fish. Now I will go to the graph. You can see the graph. I have put a very, very simple graph. What I have done? Come to your theory here. Equal point pressure. Okay. 20, 18, 16, 14, whatever. No problem. Okay. Here, intra pleural pressure. Here, intra pulmonary pressure. So, IP, IDP. Okay. IP. If it is bigger than IDP, I mean intrapulmonary is bigger than the intrapleural uh, pressure, it will come inside and go easily. The EPP is attained only at bronchus where you have a bit of cartilages. So no problem, no collapsing happens. But if this happens bigger than this, EPP will be attained very soon here. What happens normally in the asthmatic case? Here, what I'm saying to you, in autogenic drainage, we have a three phase according to the Belgian course. We tell the patient to have a breathing at very, very low lung volume. Okay. <clears throat> now you understand if it is a breathing at low lung volume, it will work for the, it will work for the getting uh, unsticky phase. I mean, it will get uh, collections to get unstick and more lights. Okay. After three or four uh, breathing like that, we say patient to go for <clears throat> we say patient to go for little more than the little more than uh, lung volume. What we say that uh, mid lung volume, right? So mid lung volume bring uh, again it mobilizes to the normal no, normal bronchus. Okay, it doesn't get disturbed with this. Then at last phase we say patient to have breathing high lung volume okay. and this high lung volume which happens in the inspiratory reserve volume <clears throat> high lung volume in this case what happened air comes here easily goes there and it pushes the secretion to go out that is how and that is attained by generally huff so one or two huff after the air uh, what we say evacuate phase that works uh, well for evacuating all the secretions from within. So this equal point of pressure, if you understand properly, if you understand properly, I'm telling you, you are the master of cardiopulmonary physiotherapy techniques. Then you know how much to do, what to do. So what is the rationale behind doing the mid lung volume, high lung volume, why they keep talking about it. It's not that high lung volume, that means that uh, more air will go inside the lung and it will bring this put No, it doesn't. It, in contrary, if you do the high lung volume, your intrapulmonary intrapleural pressure goes very high, right? Very high. <clears throat> like that you do. So what happens? Intrapulmonary pleural pressure goes very high. It actually increases and then it goes much more than intrapulmonary pressure. It attains the EPP value very soon and it makes the dynamic obstruction. So we say, go normally, take the breathing, with the breathing control and relaxation at low lung volume and mid lung volume, do it and stick, collect in the man rockers. Then you do that, what you are doing, it will help you uh, taking it out because here you have a cartilage. So there it won't have any collapse. I hope it is clear. Now, next is the first lip breathing. 
so dear participant today also your homework is please go and talk uh, please go and see uh, wherever you want to refer you refer it's called pressure point it is very very easy to understand so for a pga first lip breathing first lip breathing as you know it is to reduce the work of breathing subject loosely first the lips so the first lip breathing and exhale you can remove the mask and do it just take the pillow if you want take the patient relax they will uh, uh, okay this, this is one of the best breathing to control the dyspnea the mask thank you so much so it's a forceful expiration expiration that can increase turbulence in the air and cause further restriction i'll tell you what happened here actually <clears throat> if you are doing like this uh at end of the session then i'll be discussing about this quality airway pressure we always have you heard about in ventilator there is a mode called peep that is a positive and expiratory pressure why do we want that we want in our uh, uh, this uh, alveoli some positive pressure to be maintained that will be helpful for keeping it open okay so next inosentry technique inosentry technique as it doesn't uh, It, as it looks like a name it's not so innocent but it is generally to prevent the forced to expiration there by reduction of excessive energy consumption and improved expiratory flow okay procedure is how i will show you take the normal deep breath okay tell the patient to have a normal breath and and he doesn't have to use the abdomen for this of course and then what happened in this case the physio will be telling how to take it in and then how to take it out okay remove the mask and do it now so then yeah wait so it's up to the physio's voice how much are they able to uh, how much are they allowing to do it okay it improves the PAO2. Okay. Next is the Butico technique. Very important. You can have a mask and expiratory hold. Here, these all techniques are for expiratory part. So how it happens? It's an end expiratory hold. It has to be done. It's very easy. Uh, what you do, patient? You make them the sideline, and then sideline. You close that mouth. Generally, you know, after the surgery, we try this kind of breathing. It's very very good. Some part of Europe they do it. and then in this case they will tape the they will tape uh, the what we say that uh, they'll tape that uh, patient's mouth so that they don't take it any uh, kind of uh, extra breathing from the mouth and then a hold of every expiration uh, at end what it happens it increases the respiratory acidosis okay so i mean generally saying that P pso2 if it is increased then definitely that that helps in bronchodilation during the stable phase so this is uh, this technique is supposed to reverse the symptoms lessens the need uh, for the medication and uh, preventing the asthma attack so this is one of the important things you can do for the acute cases now next is stress respiratory exercise it is used in subjects those have a tension due to the fear and anxiety which prevents full relaxation of muscles of uh, inspiration therefore frc is not attained you know very anxious patient so it can also aid in removal of uh, a removal of uh, secretions but how do we do that that is something important it's a high lung high, high volume high velocity low volume low velocity this type of two are there panting we say panting is something first type of stressed expiratory size high volume uh, high uh, capacity uh, sorry high volume high velocity in this case we say patient to inhale to vital capacity and briefly exhale forcefully at high lung volume repeated for several times do it like Good. That just see that how he is inhaling to the vital capacity and uh, briefly exhaling forcefully at high lung volume. Okay, so this is how <clears throat> high volume and high velocity concept is followed. Pacing. 
very very important it is to decrease the work of breathing how do we do that simply we test i is to e ratio means expression to expression ratio for various movement what happened in the walking we say patient asthma patient you try that uh, suppose we are seeing that the one is to one is there means the uh, timing of the inspiration and expression is almost equal so so what do we do we try to improve that uh, inspiration and expression timing with the different kind of activities like the simply the walking you can tell that one step of walking breathing in one step of the uh, two step of walking is breathing out that is how they uh, their uh, uh, brain again uh, reeducates the pattern of breathing exhale with efforts please light on i'll show that exhale with efforts suppose uh, this is a pipe okay there are two methods there, there is a pipe okay in this pipe what happens uh, there will be a particular hole okay particular hole this hole will be uh, can be adjusted uh, with the valves and then you have to tell the patient to um, uh, exhale uh, like a plb uh, firstly breathing and then uh, repeat the sequence stop the motion during the inspiration and continue the activity okay so <clears throat> any activity they can break into two parts now respiratory muscle training in this training i was telling you suppose there is a pipe so low pressure high loading how do you do that patient is said to breathe at highest rate of 15 to 30 minutes a rebreathing circuit like a co2 mask or something uh, you have to use to prevent the hypocapnia the purpose is to increase the endurance of the muscle okay here high pressure low load uh, high pressure low flow load how do you do that i'm telling you suppose this is a pipe and you have a various diameters here where you can control through the valves okay you tell the patient and do it okay so now uh, remove the mask please so suppose he is able to uh, blow it okay he is able to uh, breathe in and blow it okay it is a, as i told you there is a spring attached here so in this case what happened uh, there is a particular pressure whenever he is able to blow then only it will reach okay so say for example uh, pressure has come 200 unit the 80% of take if you take uh, 160 unit that is for the strength and 60% if you take that is for the uh, 120 so you can tell the patient 5 minutes twice he will be daily practicing with this pipe okay after practicing this pipe he can go for the 15 minutes practicing every day for three times okay so what is happening here basically he is trying to do that uh, practice through the particular through the particular uh, uh, wall kind of thing or spring or piping kind of thing where he is able to increase that now the most important part is the diaphragmatic using the weights what we can do mechanical resistance though they say but we say at the is we will put a weight okay okay it is basically for thoracic listen and cervical listen peak patient his supine line weight pen have placed on the epigastric region subject with neurologically intact diaphragm can start with the five pounds just five pounds don't do it more okay if a person can start uh, using a, a sternocleidomastoid muscle here if you see that during breathing in and out his sternocleidomastoid muscle pops up reduce the weight other price five pounds to be good and okay breathing in breathing out that's basically to strengthen that is it clear diaphragmatic training okay next is the breathing cycle technique it all depends on the physio in out how do you do that two three four like that now these many sequence you learn say for example more than 20 types of breathing exercises we went through but how do you suggest the suggestion is due to the suggestion is through the assessment Assessment is through that. Uh, next is preparation of breathing exercise. You know, you first you assess your patient. Then you then you prepare for the breathing exercise and you choose which all breathing has to be done. For that, you must use the analgesics in case of pain they feel. You can use that uh, uh, humidifiers, nebulizers. You can you can actually tell the uh, you can actually go for the postural drainage before breathing exercises. Then you can go for the choice of breathing pattern. How how you feel. Epi, as I told you, apical breathing is quite common in the patient. Predominantly, it is seen. So, in that case, lateral coastal or diaphragmatic breathing as combination you can go for. In lateral breathing exercises, as in case of lobectomy, also you can see. And then manual contact is given to provide the proprioceptive stimulus has to be 
all the time together choice of the starting position as i have told you is there no dyspnea you can choose for more number of breathing exercises but is there some dyspnea you have a very very less number of exercises to be done initially so make sure that when ventilation to perfusion ratio matches better you go for the prone ventilation in case of uh, dyspnea even persistent and sure relaxation of abdominal muscles by flexing the hip as i told you in an initial phase of our class and uh, assisted by the gravity uh, the descent of diaphragm during the inspiration these all things you have to be check here and then you have to choose the breathing exercise because everything will not be everywhere next is the cupping and huffing as it is seeming as uh, every one of us know about this cupping and huffing just one second yeah cupping and huffing so cupping is an inspiratory effort as every one of us knows with a close glottis a close a cup is stimulus is initiated by irritation of trachea by irritation and abnormal stimulus provokes sensory fibers in airways to send impulses to medullary cup centers of the brain the stimulus can be mechanical physical chemical thermal or inflammatory now let us talk about the phases of that deep inspiration closure of glottis forceful contraction of abdomen and then opening of glottis and forceful exhalation now what are all the instructions has to be given to the patient that i have given in the stage wise please go through that that's very very important now the techniques we'll talk about because our all the theme of the uh, of the what we say um uh, box of today is about the techniques techniques how do you learn the techniques right so cuffing technique also we will see we have three techniques okay active cuffing assisted cuffing and passive cuffing after cuffing and huffing techniques we will go for uh, after yes are you able to hear me Yes, sir. Is there any echo? No, no, no. Okay, fine. So techniques we'll see for the coffee. Active coffee, assisted coffee, passive coffee. So here in active coffee, we have a double coffee, controlled coffee, pump coffee, a series of three coffee. then assisted cuffing will have a self assisted and therapist assisted then we will see the passive cuffing also in that case uh, passive cuffing uh, uh, okay fine let us start with the active cuffing first please sit down i will uh... yeah can you see the model model yeah yes 
so what i was talking about active cuffing technique where we will see about the double cuffing okay it is there in your manual but uh, is there any difficulty please learn it because the techniques may not have given they have given the name of the technique just see that for to do here you say the patient to have a deep inspiration where you say the patient to have a deep inspiration and uh, perform two cups in one breath okay secretion uh, the, generally the first uh, will be lesser and the second will be more effective okay so you take the deep breath in please now you come <laughs> okay in single breath two cup <laughs> yeah first will be normal second will be more yes so double coughing is there very simple as every one of you now controlled coughing patient take three deep breaths exhaling normally after first two and then coughing normally on the third first two breath generally we do for the you know attract cases cases and increasing the volume of cough so take three deep breaths first deep breath exhale second deep breath exhale third deep breath cough it very good now the pump coughing okay here what happened patient take three deep breaths then give three short easy cups followed by three puffs pump coughing yeah take the take the normal deep breath in short cough yes again go for normal breathing in short cough take it Start up. Now give the three half hard. Remove your mask and show everyone how do you open your mouth. Don't worry. No COVID. Move the mask. Okay. Now next is the series of three cups. Series of three cups is uh, like most of the people they use that. A patient take a small deep breath. Take a small deep breath. gives a fair cup then a bigger breath gives harder cup and the finally a better uh, you know much more breathing and then give a much harder cup yeah normal breathing normal cup harder breathing harder cup finally give take a very good breathing and give a very good cup ha <coughs> ah, this is the series of three cups okay passive coughing technique is basically uh, let me tell you later it is uh, like a uh, like a, we do the tracheal tickle you know coming out of a patient coming out of anesthesia we do the tracheal tickle and then uh, ipvv ipvv if you give to the patient generally they cough initially a suction effort nebulizer hydration these all things if you do the patient coughs next is the assisted coughing techniques there you have a two types of techniques correct in your manual if it is there is some problem manual assisted technique and self assisted technique so i will be telling you about manual assisted techniques the first technique is costophrenic assist can you lie down please okay wait wait you can take it either you can do it in the lying down or you can do it in the uh, sitting okay so here what happened Make the patient like uh, relax, and then you go near the patient from the right side always. Suppose this side I'm doing. You go near the costophrena angle, costophrenic angle, and tell the patient to have a normal breathing in and out. Okay. After doing one or two times of breathing, what you do at next of ex at end of exhalation, give a quick. downward and inward stretch downward and inward stretch 
it actually facilitates the stronger diaphragmatic and intercostal muscle contraction during the succeeding inhalation. That's the reason. That's the reason they they build up a uh, uh, pressure inside, and then the there, there is a strong pressure on his uh, hand, and then it happens what the cloth comes. Okay, so how to do it? You understood? Postural prana angle. You are keeping your palm. Okay, you are assisting the patient. Okay, fine. Take the deep breath. After one or two deep breath, uh, sorry, the normal breathing, telling the patient to take a deep breath. At the end of expiration, at end of expiration, you give a quick downward and inward stretch and tell the patient to actively cough. Okay, this is something called the osteophrenic assist method. Now, hemolytic type or abdominal pressure. Hemolytic type assist. Here also you can make the patient sit or lie down. I always believe that uh, suppose the patient is very weak, you must go for the side line. Otherwise, the sitting is almost okay. What do we do here? I'm focusing the camera again. Here you can see. Okay, placing my heel or hand about the navel of the patient. Okay, navel of the patient, heel of the palm. And the patient is instructed to cough, therapist quickly pushes, any therapist, whichever, whoever is standing here, therapist will be quickly pushing, as if pushing in, as if pushing in and up the diaphragm, so that cough comes effectively. So finally, what, uh, what we are going to instruct the patient, breathe in, breathe out, Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, and then while breathing out, breathe out, that time you are doing what? Up and in, sorry, in and up, that is your pressure. So that makes the patient to do the coughing. But I'm telling you, don't do it abruptly and hardly. You can do the same thing in the sideline also. Okay, fine. Just lie down. I'll show them the sideline also. Come to the sideline, please. What I showed you, navel of the hand. Okay, navel of the patient. Therapist has to keep the hand. And then in and up. Okay, after the deep breathing. In and up. But don't do it abruptly, hardly, and harsh wise. These all are the methods. You can choose one after another. That does not mean that every method adjusts everywhere. Just one sec. We will discuss about the third method that is called the anterior chest compression method. Anterior chest compression method basically both upper and lower anterior chest during the coughing maneuver. What I have to do, I have to put one arm across the patient's pectoralis region. That's good. Okay. And second part, I have to keep either, uh, okay, come to the sideline, let them see better. You see what I'm saying? First part, pectoral region. Second part, on the lower lower uh, lower rib region. Okay, lower rib region. So what is happening here? I have to assist. I have to suggest the patient to have a breathe in. Please breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. So what is happening, I have to give the quick pressure 
on both the side at a time okay in this kind of pressure what is happening we are trying to stimulate the overall rib cage to go for excessive pressure i'll tell you one thing and you see if you can see that my direction first i showed you where to keep lower rib upper uh, upper pectoral region now my direction was like this means my direction was if you see it was like this i'm making a v i'm making a v okay i'm making a v while breathing out i'm making a v so that i'm at, uh, assisting patient to take out the secretion okay so there is something called a counter rotation also if you know about more about pnf what happened here we tell the patient to go from the another side or this side what do we do scapular uh, what we say scapular rotation with the trunk rotation so breathe in breathe out okay while breathing out we take the hip backward and scapula forward so if you see it is basically the rotation of hip superiorly and then scapula is rotating inferiorly right anteriorly and inferiorly so breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out so these all are the manually assisted method now i'll be telling you about the self assisted techniques because once you teach your patient self assisted technique is uh, he can practice every 3 4 hours 6 hours whenever he feels so fit okay and there are some 3 4 self assisted methods first time come on the prone i'll show you on the prone what to do you have to keep the elbow head flexion okay like this you do it ha huh. this also is okay okay yeah breathe in no no breathe in and look up without <coughs> cough so after two three times of normal breathing in and looking up then breathing out and looking down what happened after third time or fourth time you have to expel the cough you have to teach the patient to expel the cough now you sit down long sitting keep the leg this side let the participant see yeah keep the leg this side i'll tell you no no go a little forward yeah so in this case what happened take your hands also forward you know it is all are very good for uh, paraplegia patient breathe in breathe out breathe in breathe out and after two three times breathe in and give a cough ha ah, yes so these all are the self assisted technique the same thing the very very same thing you can do when the patient is sitting on the wheelchair only difference is the leg will be at 90 degree bent knee position isn't it you can try the very same technique there is knee knee will be bent at 90 degree you can try the same thing what we say the short sitting self assisted method okay there are something called the hands knee rocking all these uh, not practically possible or not practically doing many people or mostly in the parkinson ms cerebral palsy all those cases we are trying to do that if you are interested in seeing the hand knee rocking self assisted i'll show you come to the uh, cat cable okay look forward like a cat breathe in breathe out look down breathe in look up breathe down make this okay. now rock your hand breathe in go like this breathe out yes so after doing for three four times he will come why are you seeing this side you breathe in breathe out <laughs> yes so this is how it has to be done and see rocking self assisted rocking type fine sit down after that there is something called the splinting part you know uh, this very popular this uh, beer method i'll show you how to do most of the time we tell the patient to learn uh, how to like therapist we say that uh, how to learn that uh, particularly that uh, you know like splinting part and uh, uh, 
how to hug the patient. So we say patient uh, to always, if they cough, they don't, they should not cough. Uh, like uh, without any support, the uh, support, the incision part is here. This will be well supported like this while coughing. Be very, very careful. If patient is not able to support, you support, go like a beer hold method, give it, and then tell the patient to go for coughing. But never ever do without sprinting, without supporting. Huffing techniques, you know very well, in this uh, two type of huffing, we take in opinion, mostly effective and ineffective. Most of the time, if mouth is open, it is effective coughing, but mouth is half or almost closed, it is an ineffective huffing. Chest ball abdominal contract, there is a post size sound ineffective huffing, but here abdominal is not used. Rate of respiratory flow varies with the uh, people, varies with the patient, okay? It degrees of the air and then flow obstruction, but incorrect quality of expression, too vigorous, too long, too gentle, too short, ineffective huffing, uh, it makes quite pressure. Now it's the postural drainage. Postural drainage is an airway clearance technique that uses gravity to assist in the mobilization of secretions from bronchopulmonary segments to central airway. Principle of this technique is that bronchopulmonary segment and bronchus is in the parallel to carina in a peculiar position so that gravity can assist in mobilization of secretion. Okay. I will, I have given in my manual, there are, uh, I think the, I have made it simplified and uh, what's the most simple method to remember the postal drainage. I think it has uh, given already in my manual. When it reaches to you, kindly go through that. You can practice like that. And uh, today I'll show you some of the movements because in my place, it is not possible to show that uh, head uh, movement up and those things. But I'll try as much as is possible from my side, I'll try. Okay. Because the head, uh, this one cannot be possible. Okay, let us, let us see what is possible. Bring the long sitting, long sitting here like this. Now we are dealing with the upper lobe. Just see, semi-line position, what you say, the semi-flower position. Upper lobe, apico posterior, both the side. This is the position. Semi-flower position, bending the knee at 45 degrees. Oh, sorry, uh, bending the knee uh, uh, by keeping uh, some pillow or uh, towel roll or bolster in between. Okay. Now upper lobe, both side, posterior lobe, what do you do? Keep the leg straight or you can make the patient sit on the chair. Then uh, you can tell the patient to go like this. Okay. Posterior lobe, both the sides. Sorry, posterior, uh, epico posterior segment, upper lobe, both the sides. If it is a uh, uh, like upper lobe uh, anterior uh, segment, anterior segment means make patient lie down, lie down. In supine line, simple, very simple, supine. Don't don't complicate it because I see I see people being very confused with this. If you can do, you know, asthmatic patient or any COPD, always try to bend the knee while doing for the supine line. Always good. Now we'll be doing for the upper lobe, uh, left side. If you see posterior segment, left side posterior segment, we tell the patient, please come. We tell the patient to go for the, like this position. Side line at 45 degree, we generally make the patient to comfortable with. This is the upper lobe, left side. Now, right side, upper lobe. If it is a upper lobe, posterior side, right side, I always say patient to go for the side. Okay. Upper lobe, uh, <coughs> the story is finished. Now we will go for the middle lobe. Okay. Middle lobe, both the side, please remember only one position. Head, uh, leg side will be 14 inches up and 
turning will be 1 by 4 from the supine 1 by 4 from the supine that's it if it is elevated 14 inch leg side uh, 1 by 4 turning towards the uh, turning from the supine line say for example like this he is turning 1 by 4 from the supine line 14 inches up so whichever lung goes up for their position either so left or right same position please drive for any now we will come for the lower lobe apico basal for both the side come to the uh, apico basal for both the side i am making very clear come to the prong line keep the pillow below the abdomen Epico-basal. Again, I'm making it clear. Epico-basal. See, pillow is below his abdomen. Next is the anterior basal. Anterior basal of both sides. Come to the supine line. Okay. 18 inches leg elevation. We have the leg elevation. Hmm. 18 inches leg elevation. No, body has to be elevated 18 inches and supine line. That is for the anteri uh, anterior basal. Posterior basal, same thing. Go to the prone line 18 inches. Go to the prone line. Sorry. Okay. Now, right, uh, what we say that uh, lateral basal. Right side, if it is there, go to the sideline. Left, left will be up. And make the 18 inches ever. Take side. That's it. But remember that uh, lateral vessel of the left side and medial vessel of the right side is always drained together. Always. So, lying on the right side with 18 inches on leg end, it actually remove secretion from the lateral vessel of left side and medial vessel of the right side and medial vessel you can't give percus that also be clear so indications as you know very well it has been given in the manual too preparation means let's sit down hydration prior to posture drainage then nebulization Familiar with trailer bulb bed movement and then familiar with the IV lines, leads, tubes attached, reading uh, suction, suctioning machine. No PD uh, has to be done after the lunch hour. Then uh, appropriate time is early morning or late evening. Is put on cup has to be available readily. Techniques is very simple. Go for auscultation first. Okay. Go near the patient from the right side. Then you go for the auscultation properly. Okay. After auscultation, go for the position of the patient. Okay. After positioning, Patient in that position for some time, ask for difficulty, maintain for 5 to 10 minutes minimum, and then monitor for uh, any kind of saturation, pulse, erythemia. Patient should be encouraged to take deep breath and cough after the position. Instruction to the patient that secretion can be mobilized within one hour of treatment. Nurses will be there with you for the secretion if it comes in between. So this is how you should go for the PD. Contraindications, you know very well. Hazards, you have to remember. Then we come for the chest manipulation, like a percussion. Please lie down inside uh, on the on the front line. I'll just show that percussion. Percussion and vibra uh, shaking and vibration. Percussion also. Never do without cloth. Never ever do without cloth. And your hand should be, as you know very well, you should be free from all sides, all types of metal things. No watches, nothing. 
and then what happened here your hand should be moved like this like a cup set hand has to move your hand should not move from here for up should, should be totally free and then wrist has to be moved this is the frequency this is this is how you should do it and this kind of sound has to be come if you will not do in proper way i'm telling you it is going to hurt the patient so don't hurt the patient do it in a proper way vibration part superimposed hand listen very very carefully vibration part superimposed hand you have to give vibration your forearm muscles should be in a isometric condition and the superimposed hand give vibration from the top hand and then tell the patient to breathe in don't do anything when when there is a breath out please continue moving toward the man bronchus okay breathe in don't do anything just keep vibrating breathe out means continue toward the man bronchus if you do this this is the best way of doing vibration anywhere well then we will go for the energy conservation technique those things we'll see later control mobilization and other now there is something the last part we say the manual therapy manual therapy is something very very uh, particularly important part when it comes to the uh, cardio things it's an advanced thing uh, how do we do that okay one thing i did not tell you uh, <coughs> look at my palm i'll just show you sorry this dorsal view for neonates you can use this two finger or you can use the three finger or you can use the four finger also okay but for normal people it is a normal cup okay anyway now we go for that uh, uh, many people they do with the bell of the stethoscope also this percussion so now i will so we come to the supine line i will show you about that uh, supine line please men men with therapy cardio respiratory disorders how do we do that first of all is okay anyway he has come into the supine line so i will uh, start it from the uh, you can see in that uh, just one minute i let me know in your we do this for the decreased joint mobility shortened muscle uh, shortened muscles pain faulty posture diaphragm decreased action due to the stiff spine chest wall mobilization technique there are anterior posterior lateral chest wall mobilization just a minute uh, i will show you one after another very easy method Okay. Anterior chest wall mobilizes. I'll show you how it works. Take a towel roll. Okay. Take a towel roll. Make it proper. Remove the pillow. Tell the patient to you uh, take do the hands on. Uh, 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 like a completely flexion, and then move this towards the. Keep the towel roll here. Are you okay? Come completely in between, please. Hmm. You can see the patient for you. See, can you see that? This is the towel roll. I have kept below the lower rib cage. This is the anterior wall mobilization. Are you liking? You are not liking. It's painful. No, you are liking it. He is also liking it mainly because he is using lot of mobiles and laptop. So anterior wall get tight. Got? Now the same thing you can try for the come to the uh, come to the suppose somebody has a scoliotic problem or uh, you feel that unilateral problem you can use only one side no problem. even for the lateral if you feel there is a scoliotic issue come to the side bring 
this. Yeah. Like this. See. Little down it should be. You come little down. Yeah. So this is for the lateral chest wall mobilization. Spring. Okay. So this wall, the, these all are where uh, chest wall mobilization go to the front side. Okay. Now we will be seeing the manual therapy in cardiorespiratory condition. First thing what we will see that posterior anterior glide. Okay. See my hand position. Posterior anterior glide. Wait, 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 wait. Like it, posterior anterior glide, posterior anterior. Then you can go for the superior glide of posterior transverse joint. Superior glide of posterior transverse joint. Superimposed uh, thumb. Are you liking? You have to palpate the transverse process and posterior transverse joint. You have to give the manipulation. Inferior glide, I will go to the caudal part of the patient, uh, cephalic part of the patient, and then from there, I will do the inferior glide. Okay, inferior glide. Apart from that, mobilization of ribs in crawl line. Now it's about ribs, okay? Wherever you feel there is a tightness, you are doing in the upper uh, superior side. This is the manipulation. Mobilization of ribs in front line. Very easy. These two uh, uh, hands, just see me from the behind. They are 90 degrees. We will keep it here. One hand will be in the, in the line of the ribs. Okay. And then other will be at 90 degree of this. And then you will be giving the pressure. Liking it? Yeah. Okay. These all are very, very important to understand. This gives a lot of relief to the patient. Come to the supine line, please. I will show you how to do in the supine line manipulation also. There are some other uh, three, four methods. So one method is a very easy. Tell the patient to keep the hand like this and then bring your uh, hand like this and anteriorly you sit. So adjust yourself and sit and rearly. Other method is what you can do you can pull the patient toward you. Come up. Okay. And then you can do like this. This is also aggressive method. Mobilization of facet joint. Look at here. How do you keep it on a uh, gun, revolver? Like that, you will bring like this, and then this part, this part here, the facet joint, you will mobilize. You can use some gauge also while mobilizing the facet joint. Okay, posto vertebral joint, as I told you, posto vertebral joint, as I told you, it can be again mobilized, same like this. Okay, you have to go near the joint and you have to use the anterior shift. So this completes that manual therapy part also. So now we will be breaking for about uh, exactly five minutes. Then we will be back with other part of the class. Okay. So it's a break for five minutes. Our uh, important uh, practical parts are finished. So maybe another uh, one hour, but, uh, but please get back after one hour. No, sorry, after five minutes, we will go for another part. And I'm adjusting with uh, my desk. It's a break for five minutes. Please leave for five minutes. No problem.
हेलो हेलो या बैक एवरीबडी वेल बिफोर आई वुड लाइक टू मूव आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू हैव अ क्विक सर्वे फ्रॉम यू ऑल हाउ वॉज द प्रैक्टिकल Yes, sir. It was very nice. So you liked it? Yes, sir. I know it's a short time to give these classes because you know it needs minimum twenty to thirty classes to make understand. But yeah, you all are experienced and uh, well worked with the hospital, so you'll understand well. Anyway, I'm giving you manual. These manuals, please use for the for the road map. you have any difficulty any time that's the reason i have made the group also that group you can post your question i am full time with the my rehab academy so i'll be answering you so before getting into the next part i just wanted to know about it uh well then i'll speak about something you know electrotherapy in our electrotherapy part in our cardio respiratory stuff because i am the uh, i'm the structure for the electrotherapy also and uh, i i take classes on electrotherapy i take classes on electrotherapy i i can uh, which kind of parameters you have to use what you have to use how much you have to use so these all are the things i make them understand so i have i have actually uh, brought here the small clip of uh, uh, electrotherapy so that you can understand yes in cardio respiratory condition some of the electrotherapy can definitely help you especially uh, look when the patient matters for us it matters so to have better improvement for the patient we will do every possibility every possibility of course we have to have intact of ethics so fine fine you can see that uh, biofeedback this is the most important part you see even the visual stimulus during the diaphragmatic breathing is also very very important so biofeedback it is basically the procedure by which the information about the physiological function is uh, uh, is feedback all into the individuals by means of or d3 or visual signals in asthma it is used to control airway resistance researcher have proved that due to efferent pathway of trigeminal nerve would be capable of altering airway resistance through its effect on vagal output it can increase pfr pfr also peak expiratory flow rate by decreasing tension in front nasal muscles in copd it is shown to increase tidal volume it is shown to decrease the respiratory rate and increased maximal oxygen uptake it is shown to relaxation of accessory muscles and reduction in some of the muscle tension too short wave diathermy look short wave diathermy you can use for the patient with a lot of contraindication by avoiding the rules of uh, i mean the regulations in your country because many of the places as wd is not allowed so don't use that application of short wave diathermy or microwave diathermy increases absorption of air as temperature is directly proportional to the pressure there will be increased pressure in the pleural space which increases absorption as there will be vasodilation of pleural capillaries which further increases absorption it works mechanics of body posture then we come for the electrical stimulation do you know electrical stimulation we have to do for some of the cases electrical stimulation it can be used for the weakness atrophy structural and metabolic changes have been uh, you know because these kind of changes have been observed in the limb muscle it will have a negative impact on including while you are working on the adl this function is characterized by reduced percentage of oxidative fibers you see that is something like a type 1 in relation to type glycotic 2a and 2b decreased activity of most oxidative enzymes reduced capillary to fibers ratio mitochondrial function so these all are the places where the dispensions can be dispensions can be characterized okay dispensions can be characterized 
electrical muscle stimulation can be applied to quadriceps hamstring calf or gluteal muscles layer pulse duration you can choose that 200 to 400 millisecond you can go for the frequency like 8 to 50 it improves muscle function sorry it improves muscle self function it improves exercise performance it will size tick tock when uh, i don't take workshop on biomechanics but i take uh, some classes on biomechanics i have explained what is the muscle size tick tock so you know uh, muscle size tick tock and the muscle length and tension relationship that is very very important when it comes to the to the patient treatment is not just the muscle strength which is important <laughs> Najeer, you can mute. Uh, you can type the question on chat box, please. Yeah. Yes, we have lot of uh, research articles on that. so you can uh, you can find those uh, research articles uh, maybe in the low and read book if you find the electrotherapy explained in that book they have given some of the uh, research uh, numbers you can go to the publication and you can just see about that as well the research so many of the countries of lately it was uh, not used enough and then we have lot more contraindications when we are using that uh, swd so 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 the probably that is the reason that many people they don't use and then i'll tell you one thing about the post uh, this swd sorry i took your question a little late any kind of postural pain works better with the swd so it's not the part of the today's workshop but i just told you that any type of postural pain whether it's a neck or back it works best with the swd anyway so electrical muscle stimulation as i told you 200 to 400 millisecond pulse duration with 50 hertz of uh, frequency that means the low frequency current with intensity of 10 to 30 milli, milli ampere if you are using okay okay ravi just one sec uh it improves muscle strength exercise performance muscle peak talk es uh, induced electrical stimulation induced a preferential increase in type 2 fibers and decrease in type 1 fibers that is very very important so okay next uh, before going to the next part i'll take uh, ravi's question ravi's question is how to improve ergonomics for therapist while giving percussion technique and how to give it for longer duration okay well look when it comes to the percussion and uh, improving the ergonomic part they directly don't have a relation to i mean there is no need of improving both at a time percussion is a short lived method but ergonomic has to be sustained for a little longer time say for example a patient who is a chronic cigarette smoker and with his less uh, what to say ventilation and perfusion ratio is less the less ventilation he has come to your clinic and he is asking for exercises to improve his uh, overall activity what we say the pulmonary ventilation and in that case what are you going to do of course you can't leave doing the percussion if you feel there is a there is a need of uh, getting his chest clear right you can unmute and you can interact so right but at the same time you will be working on his ergonomics the reason behind that i told you there are some manual therapy which you can reduce the pain of the person you can do certain exercises uh, if you remember those exercises we do with the belt we did with the we did with the what we did with the went we we did with the those exercises for the chest mobility exercises basically we did we did basically why we did basically to correct the ergonomics that is going to improve for longer time right but when it is uh, giving a percussion part percussion part will continue even though the ergonomic is bad so percussion is a short lived thing so that we will anyway continue but we our work will not finish there because unless we will correct the ergonomic part for any patient we cannot leave is it clear sir about ergonomic? the therapist part sir suppose uh, about the therapist part sir in giving percussion 
therapist for longer yes sir for give, for giving longer time uh, i feel uh, while giving percussion my hands get fatigue easily so that's my question sir so sir we are talking about ergonomic of the therapist is it yes sir ha 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 okay fine 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 i was thinking about the patient first just one minute yeah, okay, listen, okay. listen me properly yes listen me properly first of all uh, listen very very properly your bed has to be adjusted at greater trochanter of your own body that is the number one that will not tire you number one number two always remember keep one leg forwarded okay your dominant leg basically your dominant leg keep one leg forwarded and keep it over a stool if it is possible and your hand has to move your forearm has to be static okay that is the best ergonomics for a therapist while giving percussion sorry i misread your question sorry i misread your question okay sir i understand got my point yes sir yes sir got it sir level bed is all your good now there is a point if you go to the home care how will you make the greater trochanter point so in can arrange pillows uh no yeah yeah if it is a percussion if it is a pd yes definitely you can use a lot of pillows and then uh, uh, make sure that patient bed is movable means make patient make is height adjustable and then side going you know nowadays modern bed goes every direction and those things can happen yes but make sure that a physical i am coming to that energy conservation chapter just now after this energy conservation always say okay let me come on that and then we'll discuss yeah energy conservation technique if you see energy conservation technique uh it is very very important for a physio to understand that how they will they will be able to conserve their energy so a strategy you should have just one or two strategy maximum three what is that compensation by any other alternative method if you can do it or you go for the increased awareness on how activity is performed modification of activity or use of assistive devices okay the thing is as a therapist greater trochanter is the best height you can greater trochanter is the best height where the bed can be adjusted number one number two those therapist has to keep one thing in the mind while making the patient movement say for example you are doing the chest mobility exercise please mobilize your body also with the patient that is the energy conservation technique please mobilize when you are giving the passive movement to somebody bed ridden when you are giving the pnf respiration please mobilize your body also this is the best energy conservation technique and very few places we come to know about energy conservation technique though, though, though there are lot of research on the energy conservation but we find in our textbooks quite less isn't it i was very lucky to get uh, taught by uh, a great professor about the energy energy conservation technique while studying the neuro class so what i'm saying you that it's the best part one piece keep in the mind unless he is stable we can't make this system okay it was very good question by ravi that uh, maintaining the posture and ergonomics while giving practice and i thank you for this question so i have given some uh, 10 or 15 types of work simplification techniques i would uh, request you to go through that how do we do that and i am very sure that any of these techniques will be working for your patient it's not just ergonomics it's, it's about uh, say for example one patient having a neuromuscular disorder say for example dmd okay or uh, or say for example muscle uh, mus uh, multiple sclerosis 35 lady what do we do do we use the normal spoon no we don't we use the long handle why it is easy to do even for their laptop work we don't use the normal keypad we have a device where she will be or he will be touching and the particular scanned word will be coming right you can remember the the great physicist called or uh, named uh, the stephen fleming stephen hawkins okay he had a device the same thing 
he was he, he was the person of the person with the motor neuron disease and quite progressive so even in this case what what used to happen like his finger work so he'll be scanning the world and it will be coming on the computer and he'll be trying to interact interact with the people that's how he uh, has been always delivered his lectures in physics all through his life so energy conservation techniques as a physio i'm telling you nobody can else understand better even the occupational no doubt about it but physical therapists can understand much better they can improve their patient much better if you, your patient is a copd a uh, 80 year old lady or 70 year old male or whoever you can you can use the bathroom with the rods you can make uh, install uh, everywhere in the home the rod why because whenever they are walking they have some support true they can use the high chair so that their feeding becomes normal they can use the laptop table at their bed so they can use lot of things and then they can have a long uh, chair i mean what we say high back chair because uh, in copd you know very well this uh, protruded chin that is the posture is very common and then uh, in this case what happened this upper cervical vertebra get more stiff right so in that case what happened if you tell the patient to have a high back chair with the cushion so they always rest their neck like this so if they rest their neck like this there is always less chance of neck pain you know associated pain with the copd no trapezial strain no rhomboid strain so what i'm saying you this basically the energy conservation technique is something very 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 important and when it comes to the physio i'm telling you physio are the best person to guide about it i hope that uh, many of the physios in coming days they'll have a beautifully uh, beautiful style to work for uh, for the conservation of energy technique and we can make a lot of things <clears throat> so if you see the i was talking about electrotherapy the only tense was uh, remaining and uh, tense if you see that it works in reduction of breathlessness in copd application like if you go for 40, i have given some dose 45 minutes of acute tense located in um, acute points like xp19 that's according to the traditional chinese medicine and uh, how it works for the dyspnea and what is the frequency you have to select pulse width and then timing of course duration and then decrease in the pain after rip fracture dry pleurisy and following thoracic surgery please use the tens post operative thoracotomy pain usually you uh, brief tens means the high frequency high intensity tens are used that is just for 4 or 5 minutes but i'm telling you it reduces pain by activating the a delta fibers so electrodes are placed above the site of incision or on the either side of incision i will show you how it is done i have a i have a, a picture for this i'll uh, show near the camera you can see like how can you can place the electrode please see how you place the electrode either on the size of the uh, in uh, in season above the size of the in season or you can uh, go for the both side of in season okay so this is how you place the electrode and then um, go for the method of relaxation jacobson method of progressive relaxation michelson method of relaxation that is not uh, more uh, important part of our workshop and then uh, devices used in cardiopulmonary devices uh, cardiopulmonary disorders like spirometer you know very well flow rate rated and volume oriented this uh, this works on sustained maximal inspiration as i have told you as i explained in earlier part of my class sorry middle part of my class and then cpap and bipap i told you continue cpap is something like a continuous uh, its full form is continuous pressure airway continuous positive airway pressure so in this case what happened it works like a splint to keep the airway open all through the night which is having a possibility to close down in the uh, copd cases uh, during the sleep in the night so it works like a splint and keep the airway open but it comes with its negativity negativity like uh, dryness of the mouth and dryness and uh, dryness of uh, what to say the like a uh, uh, it it can uh, you know monotonous uh, movement of the air keeps happening and the pressure of air keeps happening so sometimes the oxygen and carbon dioxide level can mismatch each other so we have something called the bipap bipap and cpap are same no doubt but only thing in the cpap you have only one preset pressure here in bipap you have a two level pressure so high level pressure comes down to lower level pressure when they uh, when it finds that pressure uh, uh, situational pressure of oxygen is good above 96 or 98 in the body 98 in the body it will maintain certain level and when it is coming down at 95 94 like that so again the next okay well 
uh, higher level of pressure will be used. So next is the uh, IPPB intermittent uh, positive pressure breathing. And then after that, it comes the PP therapy, bladder valve, a capella. PP is something like a positive expiratory pressure technique. In this case, what happened, uh, we maintain some of the positive pressure inside our uh, lungs so that I have told you in other part of my class, if you can see this picture, uh, sorry, this picture, there is a cross, I mean, there is a channel ventilation. So suppose there is a plugging here, the air will come from top, it will go to another uh, channel and it will cross from the ports of corn and it will clear this and it will go out like that. So this is the theory of PEP. Okay. And uh, you have the machine called flutter. This flutter is nothing. It is uh, flutter is a kind of pipe kind of stuff. Uh, you would have seen in many of the hospitals or in your clinic also the air goes and there is a there is a there is a small bulb okay when when the air is passing that bulb is uh, uh, vibrating that, that ball is vibrating and that vibration creates the positive pressure inside the at the alveoli that is what is very important and you would have used the embu bag that also <clears throat> So these all devices are very, very good devices when it comes to the positive pressure maintenance because positive pressure is something which is the key of, which is, which is the key of, uh, uh, what we say that, uh, uh, which is the key for a lot of uh, uh, respiratory disorders. It, it reduces air tra trapping in asthma and COPD. Uh, it it adds in molecule of uh, you know some uh, retained secretion as I told you in the photo. It prevents or reverse the atelectasis. Uh, it it is used to optimize even the bronchodilator delivery and it reduces the incidence of the chest infection by reducing the plugging. Okay, fine. I'll take uh, HFC VO and these all are the type of uh, uh, ventilators and then mechanical air insufflation cups assist machine. These all are uh, widely used in hospitals, oxygen delivering systems like low flow, high flow, reservoir, and closer. Okay, fine. Uh, Nazir has a question on um, ACBT technique. Well, ACBT technique, uh, <clears throat> what do you want to understand? Did you understand uh, how does it work? I will go to that. Don't worry. I'll ask uh, where you did not understand. So, yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, basically, I have uh, opened the site of uh, ACBT. You can see uh, there is a three page breathing control, thoracic expansion, and FET, post expiratory technique. What do we do here? Breathing control, normal diaphragmatic breathing, but here you have, uh, you can go more and more than the tidal volume, of course. And then after three, four diaphragmatic uh, breathing, uh, breathing, then you can go for the thoracic expansion exercise. Means you go for more and more than the tidal volume. That is, you go for the inspiratory reserve volume. And then after going to that, you can directly from there, you can go for one or two half, what we say the post expiratory technique. So that, you remember that EPP theory, right? Equal point pressure theory. Why do we do breathing control or the normal breathing exercise uh, at first phase? Because we want to collect from the periphery those secretion. We don't want to develop equal point of pressure so deep into the lung. We want to develop somewhere in the bronchus, okay? When it is getting collected in the bronchus, after that, we go for again simple breathing control to relax the patient. Because if you think from the prospect of the patient, they'll be tired after doing some six, seven deep breathing, right? So after doing the breathing control and relaxation again, you go for the F.
in this uh, slide, if you see very clear volume. Extremely sorry, I, I didn't see that. Okay, anyway, uh, I have given this thing in completely in your manual. This thing, please use as your, uh, what we say that uh, a roadmap. How do we use that intensity? How do we use that uh, duration, frequency, course, progression? Dear participant, it can have a different type of thing also in various books, in various things, but there is no hard and fast tool. I have given the most basic, most basic point as a student, if you try to write in your uh, exam or as a professional, if you try to implement in your work, I'm telling you this is going to work. But yes, my workshop, I always say people that I'm giving you one seed. Now plant is up to you how much you can grow the plant. Okay, so these all are the skeleton I'm giving. So this skeleton will let you know how to put, how much to put the muscles. So I have given the duration, frequency with the intensity. I have given uh, upper limb training also. Look here, upper limb training, I have given a very important point. What is the point? There is a assisted, there is a not assisted, means unassisted. And let's just please check your uh, gadget because uh, here we are. Here we are able to do that. So, uh, upper limb activities, if you see.
here i told either supported or unsupported supported is uh, particularly important because you can't uh, you can't expect your patient to from the day one they will be doing unsupported so supported one is very very important and uh, here the load on the diaphragm is less so once you feel that your patient is able to work properly able to have a very good understanding in that case you can go for unsupported type because there will be a terminal shift on the diaphragm for working out 60% maximal work capacity please start working every fifth or sixth session start uh, uh, like uh, uh, increase your the workload unsupported training is also done with the weight of uh, say for example almost uh, 1.6 pound or 800 gram or 750 gram lift weight at shoulder level for 2 minute with rate of lifting equal to breathing rate followed by the rest of 2 minutes very important repeat sequence as tolerated for up to 32 minutes then patient should be monitored for dyspnea and heart rate so this is the basic thing if your patient is well enough go for the more and more and more training. unsupported arm exercise without weight also can be done uh, like uh, like throwing a ball against the wall keeping the keeping the shoulder horizontal in sitting position or passing a bean bag overhead in sitting position or exercising overhead pulley in sitting position etc so please go through this strength training and uh, endurance training a uh, lower limb muscle how you can go with aerobic without aerobic and then uh, what is the flexibility part also has to be done with this so so the thing is like uh, now if i talk about uh, something uh, which is uh, what we say that uh, which is very uh, 